This podcast is a member of the Place to Be Nation family. Visit us at placetobenation.com. The only place to be in your pop culture world. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, so I might be a new voice for you. Uh, I've been um, on this feed maybe a couple times. Um, I do host a show over on PTB and Pop called Lucha Undead. Uh, and I host a show called This Week in Wrestling on the PWO feed. My name is Timothy Robert Buckner. And I am joined tonight by a couple of uh, former hosts of Burning Spirits. Um, and this is little known fact, maybe, or people may... Be, uh, be aware of it because I've talked about it in the past but I used to host a podcast called um, Poor Decisions so I figured with me and you guys together here this podcast is going to be titled In Poor Spirits um, so you know if you want to go. go back and <laughs> listen to some of my uh, my pre-woke period you can try to find the Poor Decisions podcast it's been removed from the internet but maybe you can find it on the way back machine um, and search for me making some uh, off-color jokes which I was thinking about earlier before we started this about what if someone did dig that stuff up and I had one choice remembrance which is that there was a school somewhere in middle America that was doing a play um, where they were doing a joking rendition of Chris Brown beating up Rihanna. Um, oh no. And uh, they were all in blackface and Whoa. I argued that uh, that actually the worst part about it was not the, um, the blackface but that it was making light of uh violence against rihanna who is in fact uh, a black woman so in some ways i think i was uh inventing the concept of intersectionality at the time uh showing that those two things combined uh were actually made her more of a victim and less uh rightful for the scorn and the joking so actually it was not my pre-woke period it was before everyone else had found out just how woke i was um so that's my introduction for you guys i'm joined by drew wardlaw drew how are you doing tonight uh, well, after that story, I don't know how I'm doing, but <laughs> no, I'm doing okay. Post post woke, you'd call that post woke. Post woke, um, and then I'm also joined by Kevin Hare, I think. Yeah. Yes. Kevin yes. Hare, both of you guys from Burning Spirits, and then we got the third chair, former guest on Burning Spirits, good friend to Kevin, and hopefully by the end of this night, good friend to me, Tomas. Uh, I don't know if that's how you want to be introduced, or if there's anything else you want to be called by. Oh, no, that's fine. That's my name. Last name's Rodriguez, but, you know, Tomas is just as good. Middle name Logan. Victor Logan. I have two middle names. Victor Logan. <laughs> middle name Logan? Yeah, my dad loved Logan's run in the 80s, and my mom oh. wanted Victor, so they put him together. Awesome. Huh. <laughs> I, mean, very cool. I just so found this out earlier. Did she want so. Victor as in, like, she just wanted your name to be Victor, or did she want you to be someone who won very often, was victorious in life? What was the... Well, I mean, if we're going to break it down, originally I was supposed to be a girl, and I was going to be named after my grandmother, whose name was Tomasa. So when I came out a boy, I became Tomas, and I have no idea where Victor came from. This is just the story they always told me, was that my dad really liked Logan's Run. So if you were a girl, you would have been named after NXT champion Tommaso Ciampa, is what you're telling me. My mom was a huge fan. She had a crystal ball, and she'd always talk about She couldn't wait until he was a top guy. Sicilian psychopath. Fantastic guy, I mean. Um, And we're here for a very important occasion, um, which is to talk about... Hey, Tim. Yes? Sorry, could I... I'm sorry, could I interrupt you? Please do. Yeah, yeah. Kevin, it's good to hear your voice. (laughs) It's good to hear yours, too. Sometimes I've thought about just hitting you up and trying to talk, but I haven't actually just done that Colin. Yet, so. Yeah. Yeah. It's good yeah. to talk to you. That happens with me and Adrian, too. I mean, we don't talk other than doing the podcast. It feels weird uh, to have friends, that, people you consider friends that you are like, well, we can't just talk unless we're recording it, right? Like, it's, yeah. it's weird to just have a conversation with someone. Yeah, um, we, do talk, we do talk every day on, the, on our own private Slack. Oh, you guys have your own private Slack, huh? Very, yeah. very exclusive. Nice. I always talk about the the mysterious Slack for the you know unaffiliated website that no longer exists. But I just recently got added to another uh, wrestling related Slack, so I'm my cup runneth over, as it were. Maybe I can get into this mysterious hidden Slack with you guys too. Uh, <sighs> Good luck. It's very <laughs> exclusive, huh? Oh yeah. And hey Tomas, Drew. Yeah. Before this gets started, I want to ask you something very personal. Uh-oh, okay. Are you straight edge? Yes. Okay. 
That's it. You're good. We're good to go. I'm ready to roll now. Well, I guess I, I guess uh, I guess Tomas is not a, a listener to Lucha Undead Dead podcast, or else he would have already known that from when I interviewed yeah. you. Yeah. Um, okay. Right. Well. He, okay. Well. Okay. Now that I'm getting put on the spot, I'm gonna fall back. It was originally Kevin who said he's not sure. So I wanted to. I wanted to take the fall because I'm a good friend. Damn. So Kevin I didn't want. I didn't want it to be the awkward. Podcast. Prove but it. now I got... listen to it. We talked about this before. <laughs> we definitely <laughs> talked about. I. I think the more so the term straight edge. I wasn't sure about. Oh. Oh yeah, that's true. Do you do caffeine? promiscuous sex. Well, no, I knew that I knew that Drew didn't drink and stuff, but I wasn't sure if it was, like, actual straight edge or not. And then I was telling Tomas earlier that it's been so long that I couldn't ask. Oh, right. oh, well, yeah, I am. And as far as caffeine goes, yeah, I had to talk to the, my doctor yesterday about how much soda I drink. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no, Drew. Did you get bad news? That's something I'm worried about. Well, I mean, the thing is, is I had labs done, all my labs, you know, like all my you know, levels and whatever, and they're all normal and oh. looking good, um, which is cool. bad because it means, like, I have no incentive to, like, change my lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been changing my lifestyle, Drew. I think the last time good we for you. out, I told you, like, a, you know, don't like, I'm not like an outdoorsy kind of person or whatever, but uh, mm-hmm. I've been working out and I've been more outdoors and I've been thinking about it when I do finally make that trip up there. I want to go on one of these hikes with you. Oh, Just hell yeah. Nature and stuff. Because I'm, oh, I'm getting we sure there, man. Will. I've dropped Excellent. since like April, I've dropped like 100 pounds. People are making a big fuck. Are you serious? Yeah, oh, congrats, right. man. That's rad. Wow. Oh, yeah. um, so basically, me, I'm doing me... it out of spite. Oh, yeah. Um, cause my doctor was being a bitch when I came in, uh, when I had like a rash on my neck and she was saying that I gained like a lot of weight and I was telling her how I don't eat meat cause she was telling me what you should try to do is eat a plant-based diet. And I'm like, I basically do. I'm like, I rarely eat any meat and stuff. So then I'm like, I'm going to show this bitch. I'm gonna lose a bunch of weight and, uh, it's working. So, Hey, there you go. Now, let me ask you this. What's your regimen? Uh, I just work out what, twice what, a day. Cardio. No, no, no. What kind of, what kind of gear are you on brother? Oh. <laughs> that was oh, I was actually meaning to mention that so this is a good segue but I was going to get into it later as we were reviewing but I do want to just explicitly solicit anyone who can help me get steroids in Southern California Hell uh, this yeah. is n- in no way is this being ironic or a joke if I try to say that in some kind of court of law where they're trying to use this evidence against me I am lying at that point this is 100% sincere uh, my, my Twitter is Lucha Undead at Lucha Undead. Uh, I'm on Facebook under Timothy Robert Buckner. Contact me on social media if you can help me get steroids in and around the greater Los Angeles area. Oh, hell yeah. Because, <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to get buff, dude. I am, like, yeah. I'm losing weight, but I need to I need to bulk up, especially because I'm worried to cult- about having You need saggy to cultivate skin. mass. Yes. I'm worried about having saggy skin, so I figure fill that saggy skin up with muscle, then I got nothing yeah. to worry about. Oh. Need to get them hoses running down the triceps, brother. <laughs> yes, hell yeah, hell yeah. But okay, so we talked about straight edge a little bit, and I meant to mention that. No, obviously steroids aren't allowed. Uh, caffeine. Steroids are allowed. Oh, steroids are definitely allowed. Oh yeah, but, for that sure. Was, that was the one that I always questioned about CM Punk being Mr. Straight Edge Superstar. Is that like I've always heard straight edge did not allow promiscuous sex, and that dude was like fucking everything. Well, it's, uh... it's what you want it to be. Basically, it's just all made up. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right, Drew. So everything that you believe in is made up and stupid. Uh, but let's talk about <laughs> oh, me death too. Match me too. Me too. Yeah. All of us. We all are into well, dumb shit. Listen, only death is real, brother. <laughs> Amen. Uh, all right. So, like I was trying to say, I think maybe a half hour ago. No, it hasn't even been that long. Dude. Jesus. Time sure takes forever when you're with friends, right? Um. So we're here for a momentous occasion. Uh, to talk about a show that uh, is com- not commemorating, I guess, because he's in it, um, but just glorifying and honoring the King Nick Gage. Uh, before we get started, I do want to lay out a blanket statement because I did mention my pre-woke period before we started that I in no way endorse Nick Gage personally. Uh, I don't endorse his character, his gimmick, anything about him. I don't endorse people saying uh, MDK or gang affiliated in relation to to Nick Gage, what with the the connotation that that could in some way somehow uh, reference some kind of white power gang. But I do like death matches. I do like death match tournaments. And Nick Gage does do some good wrestling. Um, 
do you guys have anything to say about that idea? Because Quentin Moody did mention that on Psychology is Dead and the idea that people are like rallying behind someone whose gimmick could be considered at least vaguely white power. Um, I... I'm brown. I'm Mexican. And I, brother, I don't give a shit. I loved it. I loved every minute of it. That's, <laughs> <All right. laughs> That's the um... bottom line for me. My thing is I definitely can understand the connotation there. I more so see the gimmick as just – as a guy who is trying to uh, possibly puff himself up and kind of uh, make him seem maybe more harder than he actually is or whatever. And that's where all the MDK gang stuff came from. So I just always viewed it as most likely – he wasn't actually ever in a gang, but he was just trying to make you think that he he was in jail, so maybe he was. I wasn't. I never really thought of affiliation either, although I can understand why somebody else would. But I just kind of saw his gang affiliation as some like not actual, real, just kind of delusional type of thing. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's something I can buy into for sure, especially for Nick Gage, even his history pre like kind of prison stuff. He always came across to me a little bit that way that he was, I won't say like a tryhard, but he was like a little bit of like a, um, like kind of a paper tiger kind of guy. Like he was really into the deathmatch stuff, but he was never like the real kick-ass guy. It was just all bravado and kind of trying to put himself over the top with the way that he talked and acted, but realistically, right. it's like, he's not like the baddest dude on the planet. I mean, um, Drew, do you have any opinion on any of that? Hmm. I have very strong opinions. <laughs> um, hmm. I'm trying to think. So, so this this could get way off, and I'll try to really simplify this. But I, I think the way I look at wrestling is that um, I have already made a s rather large moral compromise by watching wrestling and enjoying it. So it's like I kind of I kind of accept all the all the bad things that happen. Uh, within wrestling is like that's that's part of the moral compromise that I've made which is not necessarily the best way to go about it but uh, and I certainly don't fault anyone for taking issue with anything um, right. within you know the, the uh, all the numerous bad things that happen within wrestling but that's just kind of where I uh, stand and as someone who has had to deal with uh, a lot of white power presence uh, in the area I grew up in, um, I I do not see Nick Gage as uh, anything resembling uh, that. Yeah, and like I do kind of see that too as someone who you know I will just say like I've been in jail, I've spent time in jail, not a long time, but I do know that in jail, basically all white people are kind of like quarantined off in their own section where they're called like you know these are the woods or whatever that's how it is out here in southern california or whatever and like that does not mean that you're necessarily white power but it does mean that they expect you to kind of be considered part of a the group of the white people and and it's not the same as neo-nazis on the outside who choose that as their lifestyle um I want to snake back around the same way kind of we just did starting with drew um about just big picture thoughts on the show overall i guess that's the way people usually do these reviews no you know what i don't want to do that um because that's how everyone does this stuff and i always think that it's like weird to do it that way so what i'm going to start off with is i just want big picture uh from tomas because you were at the show live and it was your first deathmatch show correct uh yeah it was definitely my first and what did you think of this being your first deathmatch show live so, uh, not to pull a Drew and kind of go off too far, but so my first like introduction to kind of like Japanese wrestling was like old FMW tapes and like this, this shit called Strangle Mania, which was like FMW, but it had ICP, yeah, like, I remember that. just like, yeah, just like talking shit over the whole thing. So it was like, I remember growing up with like Pogo, Onita, like all that crazy stuff, but I guess it kind of phased out a little bit for me at least like when i got into wrestling like wwe yada 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 up until now and over like the last year kevin was like you gotta watch this takeda guy and i was always like infatuated with guys like ishikawa and asami and stuff like that but when they were other places like ddt big japan stuff like that but kevin would just constantly harp about like nick gage getting out of prison and it like being like the greatest thing since sliced bread and and takeda's title run since like the middle of last year 
So I finally checked it out, and it was such like a refreshing thing that it's just like it's so it's just like so different. And then when I finally saw it in real life, like not to I mean I'm sure we'll talk about the show, but like the beginning, it's just, he Jimmy Lloyd literally gets thrown off like a roof of I don't even know what it was and like smashes through a table and light tubes. And this is literally 30 seconds into the show, and from there from that point on to the end, it was like a sonic boom of just like violence. Like the only way to describe it is like a modern gladiator arena where it's like, there was so much blood and it like when Nick Gage comes out, anything he says and anything he does, he's the room is wrapped up in him. And it, it was really like a religious experience. It was like a feeling that you can't like really describe. You can't put it into words until you're there and it's hard to like tell somebody like oh like this was rad because at the end of the day it's just a deathmatch show in a building behind a Foreman Mills in like an alley in Chicago but the the aura and just like the audience and everything about it was just insane it was like they're bloodthirsty and they loved everything they reacted to like every spot and I can't thank Kevin enough for <laughs> telling me to do this because it was one of the coolest things like going to shows, traveling, anything I've done in my life, it was one of the coolest experiences I've ever had. All right, sounds pretty good. Um, I'm guessing Foreman today. Mills goes hand in hand with extreme wrestling, I guess. You got this. <laughs> is... You got Foreman Mills next to the legendary ECW arena, which unfortunately, last time I was there, is closed, but still was a staple for years. What's, right next door. What's Foreman Mills? It's like a discount clothing store. Oh, like Burlington Coat Factory? Yeah, but like, so I was there in like 2009 or 2010, and they still had uh, leftover sized eight red Yankees caps. So that kind of tells you what the deal was. <laughs> hey, you, you know what I want to find someday? is uh, You know how when they at sporting events, like in the championship games, they, they print up the shirts, like the you know world champion shirts for mm -hmm. both teams? I want to find, like, the losing team's shirts. They send them to, like, Africa and stuff. Yeah, yeah, they get, so, yeah like, that's, that's what I places. heard. Yeah. My brother has a Detroit Pistons three-peat shirt Dude. from when they didn't win in 91, like, 89, 90, 91. That's so cool. That's yeah. Awesome. Like, I, I'd love to find a Buffalo Bills uh, <laughs> Super Bowl champions <laughs> shirt. I think especially – okay, so now this is going way off topic. But, like, in the world that we live in with, like, alternative facts and people believing in the Mandela effect and stuff, I feel like the, the shirt for the losing teams are probably going to become a more popular thing, like, that they're not going to send them to other countries. People are just going to want to buy them and then pretend, yeah. like, that they live in the world where the Pistons won the three-peat. Like, yeah. it's just, like, in my universe that actually happened. We're getting there. I would, like – I do I want an Eagles, an Eagles 2005 one. Hmm. The Holy Grail. <laughs> Donovan McNabb, the greatest quarterback in Eagles history. It's true. <laughs> so we'll, I think we'll get into this first match here. How's that sound to everybody? Um, we got the opening round match. Jimmy Lloyd, pretty fresh off of winning the Tournament of Death, um, which to me, and this is kind of just my talking point for it, is he feels like he carries himself a lot more seriously coming off of that in this match. Uh, coming out kind of adjusting the the weapons around the ring getting into it um, and then even as it kind of progresses throughout the match he feels a lot more serious and someone who you should take seriously in a setting like this than he used to um, even being like someone you know who's like pushed as a, a CCW fanboy who's like you know hardcore and all this stuff I think before he felt really kind of like like a deathmatch comedy worker, which is like a concept that I was talking about recently on This Week in Wrestling with Mance Warner. Um, in some ways, he's kind of a lovable loser. But now, in this match, I felt like he was presented a lot more like a guy who had a chance to win, a guy who should be taken seriously. Um, and even mentioning like kind of the opening seconds, him getting thrown off the top of the whatever that weird building is in there, um, and then going through with Slack just kind of brutalizing him. Um, he did just feel like he's a contender throughout it and, you know, even picks up the win. But um, what were kind of your guys' takeaways? Let me start out with Kevin. What was kind of your takeaways from this match? Um, first, I thought that the way that um, Schlack entered where they didn't – you didn't really know where he was and then they just, like, showed him zoomed away standing on top of this thing was a really cool image. It looked kind of like a, a movie villain type of thing where you just see this 
roided out tattooed guy just standing on top of this uh, big structure just bellowing for his opponent to come up. I thought that was cool. Um, and then, yeah, I love the uh, how just within 30 seconds they do a collar and elbow tie up on top of this thing <laughs> and then it goes right into just throwing jimmy lloyd right off like i i thought that that was all good and and uh, the commentary was also killing me during this match uh where praise act just goes like hopefully nobody gets thrown off while laughing and then literally right after he says it somebody gets thrown off and then like later when he was talking about um how like he hated the uh, fuck him up chance because like he's they're already fucking him up. I also yeah. thought that, that was very funny as well. So I, I did GCW commentary can go up and down, but this time I thought that it was pretty good and Prezak was cracking me up. But yeah, uh, that, that, oh go ahead. Oh no no sorry I didn't want to cut you off. Oh you know I was just saying I mean I was kind of interjecting which is I guess a, a fancy <laughs> way of saying cutting you off. Um. Like, Prezak, I don't know how much you guys have heard Prezak recently, but he'll do, he's done, like, some AAW shows and even Black Label Pro and stuff, and it feels like in, like, you know, 2016 through 2018 range, whenever he's doing something outside of Shimmer commentary, um, he, like, references a lot, like, oh, I'm, you know, I don't follow indie wrestling that much, I don't know what's going on too much. This is, like, the best that I've heard Prezak in a long time. It reminds me of IWA mid like mid south Prezak commentary where he's actually fun and funny yeah. and just kind of joking around and having a good time, but not I like think, yeah, I think he's ahead. very self aware uh, of right. like just kind of the absurdity of this of the situation of the show of where they were and I think and, that sometimes in general sometimes that can take away from a um, from a show but in this case with just the uh, how crazy the things are that you're watching. I think that that kind of helps bring a little bit of levity to it. Right. And I think when you say self-aware is good, but the other side of it is self-conscious. Like I said, in other mm -hmm. settings, he keeps referencing the fact that he does, Oh, I'm not familiar with this. I'm not going to know enough. Cause he's like worried about, you know, internet pedants picking him apart. But here he feels a lot more relaxed and like it, it doesn't fucking matter. Like the people listening yeah. to this aren't going to get mad that he doesn't know how many times Slack and Jimmy Lloyd have wrestled each other before or some stupid shit like that. You know what I mean? Like yeah. he's just having a good time and he's comfortable. And that's when that's to me, that's when he's at his best. Yeah. But yeah, I, in general, I, I like this match, um, especially with death matches. I find that if you have uh, a good crowd, who's really into everything and guys that are just busting their ass, regardless of how good the actual match is, it doesn't really matter too much. So even though, hey, maybe some of the guys are a little sloppy and like some things may or may not make sense or whatever, if the atmosphere and everything is there, then I will be happy. And I thought that this delivered on that where the crowd was really into everything. They were behind Jimmy Lloyd. Um, there were some crazy bumps, big time things were going on. Uh, sh Schlack hitting the flaming elbow and Jimmy kicking out of it and the crowd going crazy, like all that type of stuff. Uh, I thought that this match worked for me, even though, I mean, neither guy I think is that great as a wrestler, but I don't think that it really mattered too much here because the uh, crowd and the atmosphere uh, made it made it work for me. Yeah, and uh, uh, note about the flaming elbow. I, I was always told that Sabu wanted to do a moonsault where he lit himself on fire, um, but Paul <laughs> wouldn't allow him. <laughs> Um, and so whenever I, when I heard that, that was like when I started up wanting to do that myself when I used to do backyard wrestling and shit, um, <laughs> but I never actually did it, but I did have a friend who would, uh, light his shoe on fire and kick me in the face. Um, so when I saw him doing that, I was like, oh, that's, that's fucking radical that Slack, yeah. is, Slack is doing that bullshit. I, I saw him do that at Tournament of Death last year live, and yeah. when he did it, he burned his arm. So. <laughs> All right, so, Andrew, yeah. what did you think here? Uh, okay, a couple couple questions. First of all, the commentary was Dave Prezak, and who was the other guy? Do you know? Oh, I couldn't make out who it was. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I missed I, it I in the curious. beginning, and I, I and it wasn't was a former sure. wrestler because he was he kept referencing his history wrestling, but I did not, um, I did not catch. Yeah, him. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. Um. And, and okay, to go back, I guess, to a little bit to an earlier conversation. What What is the thing with schlack and uh not nazi affiliations or something what is that 
Um, okay. Who do you want to get into it, Kevin? Or do you want Ke- to Kevin, you it? know, don't you? I think there are some pictures of him online, possibly Sig Heiling and stuff, or being associated with uh, yeah some. There's particularly one some... picture that's like very prevalent of him doing a a, zig, a Nazi salute um, with some friends in a picture, and then also there's people who have history of like that he he did tattoos on people that were known Nazis and did like you know Nazi related tattoos for them and basically oh, okay. like why would you do that if you're not a Nazi or whatever so mm-hmm. yeah that's kind of the the thing with him on that he claims to that you know you know Nazi money is just as good as uh, non Nazi money so that's why I you know did those tattoos for them and the people that I hung out with, they weren't racist to me because I'm not, you know, Jewish or whatever. So <laughs> I never saw them be racist or whatever. Fuck well, well, I'll just whatever. correct him right now. It, Nazi money, if he's talking about Deutsch marks, are not worth very much these days. <laughs> uh, that we probably shouldn't be talking about on, <laughs> on a <laughs> death match <laughs> podcast. <laughs> um, <sighs> But yeah, obviously I don't I don't you know support any of that. But um, as far as Jimmy Lloyd goes, I'm glad you brought that up, Timothy, because that that is something that I kind of noticed too. Um, I, when I saw, I think I saw him for the first time, maybe like the last uh, Nick Gate, like last year's one of the GCW shows last year, I guess. I'm not super, you know. You guys know I'm not super deep with indie wrestling, but um, I did notice that he kind of carried himself a little better uh, this year, which was really cool. And I think to Kevin's point about uh, a hot crowd and and how that really kind of makes a death match, I think a big thing is uh, the wrestlers being able to feed off of the crowd and be able to kind of escalate things accordingly to help build up the crowd and like, there's a reciprocation there between the crowd and the wrestlers. I think that's part of uh, what makes like deathmatch psychology. If you want to get into that, like um, different than kind of a normal match in some ways. But um, yeah, I thought they actually did a pretty good job of that. And I, I thought it was cool. Uh, I mean, a, a really good opener. You have like a huge spot to start the match and to start the show, you know, and then it kind of goes and builds from there and, I think everyone was really surprised and excited that Jimmy Lloyd won. So, um, yeah, that was cool. Uh, we should mention his the gigantic cut that he got on his wrist. I don't know if you guys saw pictures of that. I know Kevin and Tom- Tomas did. Um, but, the, I mean, Tomas, you were there live, so. Yeah, I mean, it was, was to Tomas, what did you think about the match? And then talking about when Kevin talked about the framing of the entrance of um... – of slack on video but what was it like in the building was it did you guys see him climbing up there did you notice or was it a, a surprise for you as well no absolutely not so i think it was around like 6 30 that they let in like the vip and then people kind of like started trickling in like half an hour 15 minutes later and we found our seats and we were all just kind of and i was since i was there the thing i noticed when i looked around it looked like it was like an abandoned mall. Like an, like it looked like the area of like a strip plaza or like in like a, a mall. So that's what like that building that he eventually throws them off like kind of was because there was like a hallway and you could see down it and it looked like there used to be like storefronts there. It was a really bizarre just experience altogether. I was telling Kevin when we went around the corner to the Foreman Mills, it's just like hanging out at a hardcore show. It's like it's a building and then a parking lot and people are drinking and smoking in it and then you walk up like – 150 foot hallway that's like pitch black and then you are in the arena or whatever you want to call it and we were all just sitting around waiting and you know they tell you five minutes till show whatever whatever and we're all waiting and then it's it it, to me it looked like king kong like it was this monster tattooed just animal up there you know and and it's like because that's what it looked because they flash like the lights and everyone's like oh my god and it it looked like a scene out of a movie. Like it really, and you know, he tells them to come up there. And then, like I said, it, it was bam, throws them off. And like the place blew up. Like after the and, call, now, uh, collar noble tie up, of course. <laughs> oh, after yeah. some extreme technical wrestling on the top of a building, he throws them off of it. And it just, from start to finish, it just kept going. And I'm not a big 
GCW like Jimmy Lloyd guys. So to be completely honest, I I know who the name. I don't know who he was before this or you know kind of thing. I've just seen bits and pieces, but it was an obvious like underdog angle with you know Schlack is like this monster of a human. And he's like so gross to look at. Like it looks like he's gonna like burst out of his own skin, and he was the the wrist thing was it was so gnarly to see live. Jimmy takes like a lariat and he's got like he's holding light tubes kind of like up to his face. And the moment he hits like that lariat, you can see his wrist like literally explodes. Like it was such a gnarly gash and he instantly goes to the ground and he's like shaking. So that's how and I knew I was like, oh, it's like bad. Like it's not just like a cut. It's and it looked like it was going to fall off. It was so gross, but I it's a spectacle. It's one of those things that's like, I can't look away. I, I don't want to look away. And he ends up winning. And that was cool. The crowd was, like Kevin was saying, was super into it. It felt like every match people had their person that they wanted to win and fed off everything that was happening. And it just made like things build. Normal things that were like gnarly seemed 10 times more gnarly because it was just like everyone was gasping or holding their breath or, you know, just reacting to like a super big spot. Yeah, which is, I mean, a really good point about um, this show in general was kind of the booking and the framing, especially of the open round matches. And I think they actually did a great job in the final as well of, like, making it very clear who the crowd not only expects to win, but, like, wants to win. Um, But you mentioned Schlack and him coming across like a monster, and it's so funny because it wasn't my first exposure to him, but it was, like, where it was kind of eye-opening was when um because i had seen him in the the, like the dojo wars stuff from ccw because i was paying attention to it and i had already seen him but in that setting there's just something about the dojo wars that like he just seemed like a guy even though he looks the way that he did because it's like it's czw and there's so much weird shit there and it's like it's not even czw it's like czw tryout camp or whatever um but when he showed up in cwf as an invader in this like company that's like part way like old school southern indie and part way like um, like cartoony Chikara esque promotion, and then you had him and and Dan O'Hare show up as this nasty invading force from CZW. He yeah, he leaps off the page as like this barbaric monster who seems. It's kind of funny that Drew brings up his like Nazi past because he seems inhuman. Like c- comparatively, he comes across like he's not a fucking person. He comes across like some kind of monster. Um, like he's the he's the Hitler robot in Wolfenstein. <laughs> yes, exactly. Like that. Yeah, it's like I don't I don't know that guy, but he just doesn't look like a good guy. Like if someone yeah. like because my girlfriend mentioned it, she's like, oh, like this is the guy who's a Nazi, blah 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 blah. And I was just like, well, I mean, if if that's true, sure. Like that guy yeah. looks like a a scary <laughs> individual who would be like, oh, you're Mexican, I don't like you. And it's like, whoa, dude. Like it's just the look, everything about it, right. <laughs> completely well, intimidating. Yeah. Drew talked about, you know, the history with dealing with uh, white power people um, in real life. And it's like, uh, you know, there's the Tucker Carlson, like, I'm a Nazi on paper. And then there's, uh, you know, then there's the slack white power guys who, like, they look like that. And that's why they're able to be the guy who openly says I'm a Nazi. Because as fucked up as it is, like, most people are not going to mess with a guy that looks like that, you know? Yeah. They've got an aura, man. Real deal, like, Nazis, you know? It's like, it's like evil, you know? It's really scary because you're not afraid to completely put everything out there. You know, there's no like hiding behind like an opinion or like a oh a what if or oh I was just right. it's just like this. It's like you're on this is this is who I am like head to toe yeah. like no yeah. fear and it's like that's like a it's like you were saying that's a true kind of evil like a genuine scary person. Yeah. Sure. Oh man. The next match when we talk about that we talk about the the guys who are, are kind of more playing the character and, and then interestingly enough making that same reference and and i think that kevin made a good point it's like he doesn't in some settings he puffs himself up but he doesn't have the same aura as slack and that's nick gage up here and he's coming up against a kind of a legend in the industry um it's kind of interesting the way gcw is bringing back czw or yeah czw legend types and becoming the place for the uh, nostalgia of czw old school i mean they had just the recently departed uh, nate hatred wrestle in gcw not too long ago um in a return yeah that's for it's kind of been their things uh for a long time of having different guys come back they had a uh, joker come back they had uh oh, did they how did i miss that oh shit at one Sorry. point he came back it was like a long time it was kind of before they really started to pick up yeah yeah and then uh why 
guy from California who I'm drawing a blank on, but they had him come back and some other guys. Uh, they've kind of done since the beginning. They had Necro Butcher even at one point come out, not wrestle, but, you know, there. So they've kind of – that was one of the things really even in the beginning of when they kind of started to pick up some steam that they kind of used to their advantage, the old, hey, we know the CZW fan and uh, – we know what you want, so we're going to give you some of the old guys that you haven't seen in a while, and et cetera. And I think they've done a good job of kind of getting a lot of those fans to really buy in early. And um, as somebody who goes to a lot of the shows and sees people um, on a show-to-show basis, when I was watching this, a lot of those people traveled as well. So uh, they've kind of turned it – they've really uh, fed into that fan base, I guess, and really have used it to their advantage Oh, shit, I know who you're talking about now. It was Homeless Jimmy. Homeless Jimmy was one, too. Uh, yeah, he was a California and then guy. But that might, there was another California guy that I'm thinking of that I'm really drawing a blank on. I'll see if I can look it up. Yeah, yeah, but either way, yeah, I mean, they did a good job of that, and it's kind of funny to think about it because it's like third-generation ECW because CZW was kind of built off the back of being kind of referential to ECW hardcore nostalgia in some ways. Um, and then now you've got GCW showing up being like hardcore nostalgia for CZW who took it a step further, but we get the match here. Like I was, like I was trying to say, uh, Nick Gage versus Scotty Vortex, um, really quick here, really quick match. Um, going into this, I guess let's, uh, let's start out with, um, Kevin, I don't know your background of deathmatch wrestling watching that much, but for you, seeing scotty vortex here was that like a um is that a nostalgia thing for you or is that is he someone that you've heard about or or slightly so so i went to some czw shows like 2008 2009 ish and i watched a little bit back then but to be honest uh deathmatch stuff didn't completely click with me like i would watch things sometimes and i would be into it but i uh, to various degrees but it never became a huge thing for me until the past I don't know, year or two watching more Big Japan and then going to GCW shows and CZW shows and stuff. So Scotty Vortex definitely has some nostalgia stuff for me, but he, not as much as uh, some other people, I guess. But I do remember watching, I think the first TOD I watched was 2009 with when Necro Butcher, maybe 2008 when Necro Butcher was doing like the whole The Wrestler thing and Vortex was in that one. Okay. And what did you think so. of this match? I thought that this was a good match. Um, it kind of brought the crowd down a little bit from the last one. It didn't quite have the uh, balls to the wall kind of intensity that that one did, but I think that was a good thing here. Um, trying to see what I got on my notes. I don't have that much. Uh, but yeah, I, I thought that this was a good, solid first round matchup that kind of was allow, allowed the crowd to kind of settle in for the rest of the night and not get too burnt out or whatever going forward and yeah it was good yeah it, it felt to me and it might be my like my least favorite opening round match um but it felt like talking about it with vortex and with neck or with gauge that it was kind of the pulling out the nostalgia act guys and and gage in a lot of ways is in a career resurgence right now where it's you might not even refer to him as a nostalgia guy but he does have that or you wouldn't think of him as a nostalgia guy necessarily right now but he does have that kind of background and that history and then who he's going up against that's what it was and it it did feel like it was like kind of a nice little token almost like match to have to play off of that the guys didn't have to go too crazy um and it gets Gage into the the finals for where I think is where he really shines uh, for the tournament. And the crowd is obviously super into it with what's going on. Um, But I think for me, because of that and because it feeling a little bit dry, um, I'm really interested to hear kind of Drew's take on it because he tends to break things down really, really thoughtfully and well, even deathmatch stuff like this. But uh, because I want to save that for the the main course, I'm going to go to Tomas next to give me the kind of live feeling in the building uh, for this matchup here. And also, very kind of, quickly, what's your... oh, go ahead. Supreme Supreme is the oh, wrestler that fuck, I was thinking. Supreme, of. yeah, I see him at um, AWS shows still to this day. But he's like, he's got to be like close to 500 pounds. He's fucking gigantic. Like, how can <laughs> he even move around? He wrestled Tremont. Okay. Oh fuck, that's a that's a lot of dude in that ring. 
Um, <laughs> man. Okay. Uh, Tomas, what was the vibe in the building for this? And also, what's your background with Scotty Vortex? I know this was your first uh, Deathmatch show live, but you watched some Deathmatch stuff in the past. You already talked about your history there. Um, yeah, what was the so, of- straight up, no idea who Scotty Vortex is. I'll keep it real with everyone in this Skype call right now. I was texting Kevin... He told me specifically he wanted updates and no spoilers, so I was texting him every spot, every person that came out to ask him, like, what's this guy, you know, who is this, I'm not aware of this and that. But um, the match itself was fine, but before I get to that, the moment the bells toll, the bell tolls and Nick Gage came out, it, like, it came unglued, and it was, I know how you feel, you know, with MDK and, like, all that, but seeing... I haven't seen, like, with my own eyes, like, that kind of intensity from, like, a fan base in, like, a very long time. And almost kind of, like, watching everything around, like, American Indies, Japanese Indies, like, big time, whatever. It was, like, such a specific kind of, like, almost like a cult following, I guess. Like, there was dudes with, like, the MDK shirts and, like, the bandanas and, like, the whole nine yards. And in, he, he always walked around the entire ring and like any anyone he was by they just like lost their mind and I feel like that kind of like set the tone for the match which was fine it wasn't you know nearly as violent as the previous match obviously though I don't know if you guys could notice but um, there was a board with beer cans in it and like the beer cans were cut off the top so it was like extremely sharp tops and then there was like little light tubes fit in between all of that and I oh, think shit. Scotty took he took like I think it was the finish. He took like a back bump on it or something like that. It looked like really bad, but other than that, like pretty standard. Nothing overly insane. Like it's really hard to even compare what happened before to that. But it was like all around good. But it was more of like the atmosphere. It was like probably gonna say it a lot, but it's like one of those things you just had to be there. I don't know. I was telling Kevin, I'm not sure how well some things translate to tape sometimes like you know it's, oh it was like so crazy and violent or like oh it seemed all right you know I mean, one of those kind of things but it was definitely like slower but it was more just being in his presence like kevin has told me for a very long time like being around nick gage and you know he he comes out before the show and he calls he's like he calls the guy doing the music is like yo cut my music you pussy and it's like but it's like whoa but then he'll like say something to like fire up the crowd like yeah cut my music pussy i fucking love you people and it's like oh sh- am i supposed to root cheer or, <laughs> oh, all right yeah i'm into this and then he's like you know if anyone's got a problem i'll beat the shit out of you in a parking lot but i love you guys and you're like oh uh yeah okay yeah i'm behind it and it was like at the beginning of the show he says something you know god bless nate hatred or whatever and then he's like yo fuck the cops and let's start this fucking show and it like set <laughs> it like i was like oh my. like right from that moment on i was like fuck dude like i i love it like it was it's such a different way to whip up the crowd like i, I don't know you can have you know i'm gonna beat you for the bell and i'm this guy and blah 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 but it was like it, it was like what we were talking about earlier i don't necessarily believe he is you know, as bad, but it's pro wrestling, and, you're, and he just got out of prison. You know, it's so it's like one of those things you have to kind of carry. Like this is how I'm going to get my character out there, and I'm he looks like the kind of guy that'd fight in a parking lot, and so it, it works. And and everything about him just worked in that match. It didn't have to go. It didn't have to be too crazy to keep the crowd interested, and I enjoyed it. Yeah, and it, I mean it goes by pretty quick. So there's like yeah, it doesn't overstay its welcome. It's not nothing on this card is like. Yeah, Only nothing really long. dragged, which was good. It felt like sitting there and watching everything. It was like you had enough violence in between the matches to where it wasn't too long, and you didn't like lose interest or. Yeah, and and I don't, you know, I don't want to, um, I don't want to like make anybody feel weird or whatever. Like uh, like I was overly virtually virtu signaling in the beginning about the Nick Gage stuff. I just wanted to put that out there so it's clear, almost like a kind of just. PSA on the top so people understand like where we all come from when it comes to this but I totally respect the guy's hustle I respect the guy's level of overness I mean realistically like he is insanely popular right now um, and and he fits his role super well and honestly I've seen him in other settings recently SCI um, is one that I think of um, the uh, Commonwealth Cup is another where in those settings he was able to 
also still deliver pretty well and he's a guy who i thought was just fucking garbage the last time he got there the first time i guess he got out of jail uh, before he went back after violating probation he had a match with jaka that i thought was like one of the worst matches i've seen in my entire fucking life um and he's come back to where he's delivering actually pretty solidly even in non-deathmatch settings now um and super over but i think like a deep there is a major deeper conversation to talk about nick gage in reference to like populism because he does have when you talk about that a very very similar to like a political populism kind of stance and style that he has but what he does is yeah he like he turns people into other by saying like if you got a problem with me i'll fuck you up but everybody else who i don't have a problem with i fucking love you and that makes you in the crowd be like well i don't want to be the guy he fucks up so he loves me <laughs> you know so yeah, like that's how you look at him so it's like it's really fucking how i kind of yeah how i like kind of super- think this describe him is the first time i saw him live since he came out again was nick gage invitational last year and he came out to start the show and you kind of simultaneously want to run over to him and be as close to him as possible and be in it as much as you can while at the same simultaneously running as far away and if you see him come here near you it's like stan hansen in the japanese crowds like you want to just get as far away as possible but he has this kind of dual aura that really is interesting and does it that nobody else has really and so it 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 really works like it, I hate saying, like, it sounds almost pretentious, like, oh, you have to see this guy live or whatever, but I really think that he's a guy where um, he, he comes across well on tape, but it doesn't, it's not nearly like seeing him in person. It's just, there's something there that, there's a real, real feeling there, whether or not it's real or not, the feeling is there that it's just this real organic thing. And, uh, yeah, the Nick Gage John Cena promo is one of my favorite things in wrestling. (laughs) The John Cena go home promo. Yes. All right. So let's get into it. Let's get into the main event. Like I said, Drew, I feel like you've got some way to break this down for me so that it it becomes in some way engaging or whatever I overlooked. I feel like that's that's kind of my thing with listening to Drew's reviews is a lot of times you hit points and stuff that I overlooked. And that's always kind of um, really nice for me because I – I don't necessarily have that happen super frequently. So was there anything here that I missed or was it just kind of a blah nostalgia kind of deathmatch thing? Well, I don't know. I, I really liked it. First of all, I, I had no idea who Scotty Vortex was. I, th- I thought he was like very young. <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I'm with you, Tomas. I didn't know who he was, but I thought the match was really cool. I thought it was, it was a, big uh it was a good way to set that match and the opening match apart because you had a different style you had like the brawler nick gage and you had scotty vortex who was a little bit more of like a high flyer you know um so i thought it was a good way to kind of create the like the Mm -hmm. old wwf like the hills and valleys of the show kind of bring down the crowd a little bit but you still get nick gage Mm -hmm. to fire up the crowd and i thought scotty vortex like he was working hard to, you know, fire up the crowd on his own. Like he had good facial expressions and he would like tease stuff. Like he'd kind of get a weapon and like kind of gesture to the crowd and get on the ropes and get people to cheer and stuff. So, yeah, I don't know. I thought this was really cool. I, I, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, like they did some big stuff. Uh, like I said, Scotty Vortex, he's doing a little bit more of the high flying. He did a little bit of like the uh, the head scissors and stuff like that. So. Yeah, I, I thought it was really cool. I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, see, that was exactly my point. It's like, to me, it just I think I overlooked it, and it is because I'm like looking at it as a nostalgia thing. I'm figuring in this setting, it's like elementary that Nick Gage is going to win, obviously. You're not going to have Scotty Vortex return from retirement to beat Nick Gage in the Nick Gage tournament in the opening round. Um, but, you know, like you're right. Like There was more dynamic to it there, especially when it comes to that work and that kind of context between the two that uh, I kind of overlooked because of that. And it's a good point. So yeah. uh, so you did not disappoint, Drew. But um, yeah. well, I was glad. That was, that was a lot of pressure. <laughs> but now we'll go into someone who's maybe more in into your wheelhouse, um, someone who you've reviewed on podcasts before, not just um, in general, but also – with me i've been on shows reviewing this next guy with you before um we go into g raver versus isami kodaka um kodaka is one of two guys who flew over into this show from japan um 
and this crowd really respected him going up against G Raver, a guy who uh, I think the first time I saw G Raver might have been IWA's Deathmatch tournament, which I think is King of the Deathmatches, um, a couple years back. And uh, is that the one that you made me watch? Uh, you might have watched it, but I don't know if I made you watch it. I don't know if I'll go that far. I don't know. You you showed me like you you yeah, you gave me a link and I watched it. Yeah, that was yeah. that was a rough watch. Yeah, it was not a great show, and G Raver did not stand out in that match that I think also involved John Wade uh, John Wayne Murdoch, who's a guy who I who I have liked in the past. But G Raver is a guy who uh, did not wow me in the beginning with that inauspicious start, and then the few times I saw him, and then now I've, he's recently kind of won me over, and I think this match was a showing where he did win me over. But Drew, I guess if you saw that same you know IWA show and, and that you're even saying it in such a divisive way that uh, I made you watch it, <laughs> did he win you over in this match, or has he won you over in general? What did you think of Kodaka versus G Raver here? Uh, yeah, so he he has won me over um, again. I think. Well, the other one of the other recent uh, GCW shows I watched. I don't know, Kevin. What was did they do like a tournament of survival? Is is that that's GCW, yeah, right? He he was. Was he in this year's? I don't know. I've I've seen him in GCW a couple times. He had um, a great match with um, Alex Cologne. He had a great match with Ciclope. The Cologne one had an insane thing oh, where. Funny. He, the uh, Ciclope one, that's the one I was thinking of. Yes. That that one has a crazy super brain buster with um, tattoo needles into G. Raver's head where he takes a crazy bump to the outside. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I don't know. I, I like uh, – he, he's kind of won me over the past couple matches. Uh, I liked this match. I did think it was pretty dra- – like having him go up against Tasami Kodaka – it's pretty evident uh, the difference in skill level between the two. Um, so there's kind of some miscommunication, which that stuff doesn't really bug me too much, especially in like a death match. Um, but I did think he kind of stood out as like really not even kind of on the same level as uh, Kodaka, which is kind of unfortunate. Cause yeah, like, I like, I like him. And again, he's, he's a guy, he's a little bit, smaller than the big brawler deathmatch guys that you have a lot of in America. So he can, like, he's pretty athletic and he'll go pretty hard. So uh, I I like him. He reminds me of, um, and this is like, it's kind of feels like it's going the opposite of what you're saying, but he reminds me of a slimmer, more athletic kind of Masada type. um, Yeah. Okay. Where he's a little bit more adaptable than a lot of other guys in deathmatch settings. Um, yeah, but he do, he takes that in a different way, which is like he takes it into the kind of high flying and a little bit more moves based kind of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. But you mentioned that and saying like the comparison of skill, which I think is a a good point. But I also would question like who in the first round would have fit with skill level with Kodaka, like other than oh. Takeda, which I don't think you want to do them in the first round. I don't know who you put in there with him to have a better match. No, and that that's what I was going to say kind of on the back of that was it, it was like really smart booking, I guess, because uh, they fit better than anyone else would have fit together, I think. Like they have they have comparable style, the like compatible styles, you know? Right. And, um, and I think part of it, too, is that Kodaka in general, I don't think on this show, this match and, and the final, obviously, will spoil mm-hmm. that. Like uh, if people are listening to this so far and they don't know that Kodaka won this match. Um, it the the it, neither match did Kodaka really show off what makes him a great wrestler, like a guy who right. like I I really enjoy. I think he really didn't get it, and I wouldn't even put that on him. There's some people, especially some people who work for uh, New Japan, who um, when they're not in Japan, they don't really try as hard. And I didn't see that from Kodaka here really, other than he was not set up in a position to be able to deliver in the same way that he does in Japan. Um, just because the way that the number one, like the, I guess the resources at his disposal, um, Mm -hmm. you know, smaller ring, smaller building, uh, you know, less setting. Like he's a guy who really, I mean, his death match should have like some ladders and stuff involved so he can do some cool high spots and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, nothing like that here, you know, he did, he did, he did do that big knee drop, double knee drop off the turnbuckle onto the ground though, which was, that was cool. Which is like it's cool, but yeah, I'm like, I'm but yeah, no, I know, I know what you mean, though. Big ass spots, you know. Um, yeah. 
So let's. Uh, but I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to like take away from G. Raver because I do like him, and I, I. I do think like he. They worked as good, and especially, I think the language barrier is pretty vast. You know, between those two and right. all that. So you know, I. I. Th- I think it was like I really liked the match, but that was one thing that stood out to me. Yeah, well, I mean, based on the way that G. Raver looks and carries himself, I think that you talk about the language barrier. It's two guys in this match who don't speak English. Um, probably... <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just messing around. But yeah, G. Raver just recently, he was in the um, whatever spot fest bullshit on the Janela um, Escape from New York show. And that was ladders and big spots. And I thought that he was the star of that match that everyone was going crazy about Marco Stunt afterwards because, you know, he looks like a child and he says, fuck. Um, and that gets people really excited. But to me, I thought that G. Raver was like kind of the standout um, of the of the kind of the high spotty guys on the show. And and that was, like I said, a match that had ladders and all this stuff. Um, I'm, I'm like confused. All right, Kevin Thomas, who wants to go first? You guys just pick. <laughs> uh, I guess I'll go first. Um, I thought that this match was decent. Uh, as you guys are both saying, I think G. Raver is uh has really turned into a guy who's been a bit of a kind of like the glue that kind of helps not not keep GCW together or anything, but he's kind of like a glue guy where him and, and another guy that we'll talk about soon kind of almost always deliver in, especially in the deathmatch spots, even if they aren't necessarily um, presented as like the number one top guy. Uh, you'll usually w- walk away from a show remembering uh his match and like he has a match with cologne from december that was really great he had a match with C- from cyclope with C- cyclope in january that was also really great and he's had some other good ones too so i think that he's a guy that is really um benefits from being put in a position in gcw to just kind of go out there and do essentially whatever he wants he's pretty fearless and he he just will take insane things. So, um, I yeah, did like think he, this... he, oh, uh, sorry. sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, mm-hmm. like he, had, he adds depth to the yeah. card, right? And he's like, yeah. he's a good guy that you can put with a lot of different people. So exactly. he's like a real good yeah. guy to have on the roster. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The depth thing is a great way to say it because what he does is he takes a match that could just be a mid card, whatever match. And he always makes them into something that was worthwhile. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and a good example of that is from the Nick Gage Invitational last year where he wrestled uh, Miedo Extremo in the first round and uh, the ropes were bad for the first half of it. And they, him and Extremo were both able to work around that and deliver a really good match um, around a, a big issue and just kind of still adapt and, and make it work. And you don't you didn't walk away thinking that was a disaster. You walked away thinking like, man, they were really able to overcome something that could have easily been bad. So, um, so yeah, I, I thought that this was a good solid match. Um, it's another one where I I don't have that much to say about it. Um, the part where uh, Kodaka caught a G Raver um, springboard into a neckbreaker was really cool. But um, but yeah, I thought that this was solid. I think that G, going back to what Drew, I think Drew was talking about about the first round, I think that um, in general GCW does really great uh, books, really great first rounds for their tournaments. Um, Nick Gage Invitational last year first round was really incredible. The tournament of survival this year, the first round again was really great, and I thought that this first round was good, but um wasn't maybe at the level of some of those except for something that we'll talk about uh in a little while but um but i still thought that this was a good solid match and and uh yeah kodaka looked good but i'll agree where he didn't come away uh blowing you away Mm -hmm. like somebody else would later on yeah and and realistically i think that can like we'll get into kind of the bigger picture issues with the shows which i think is um was clearly there um, for for this show comparatively, which kind of sucks because when you compare it to the fact that this company does two deathmatch tournaments in a year, it's like it's kind of um, it's just a natural inclination to compare the two. Um, a, a spot that I thought was super cool was G Raver doing the uh, the senton onto Kodaka, who was like laying across the top rope. I thought I, I really thought that that was a great like just cool little spot. Um, 
and uh, and I think it's I didn't even know when you talked about the G Raver versus uh, Medio Extrema match. I didn't even know that the ropes were fucked up in that match. I just I know I knew that noticed that they brawled around the ring a lot, which I thought was awesome. Yeah. I thought they did a great job of it and made it work to where I didn't even really think about the ring being broken. And so about with that. that... Oh, go ahead. With that show, the first match on the show was a barbed wire match with Schlack and Tremont. So the ring was set up for the barbed wire and it, to start the show. So they had to take down the barbed wire and set up the ropes quickly because that was the second match of the show. So you can't have too long of a delay to get to the second match. So in the haste, the ropes were never really uh, – great and i think you could see it on the video people are adjusting the ropes while they are brawling around the ring is that is that when is that when tremont like falls through the yes the ropes onto yep. the ground yeah mm-hmm. well, yeah yeah and that and that match was great and those are two guys who as you were talking about that and i remembered that match and i remembered everything going on those are two guys who use the ropes, you know what I mean? So them having a match yeah. with shitty ropes and they still made it work to the point where my dumbass didn't even notice that the ropes were fucked up and I just thought... And they were crazy. using them when they were bad too, which was crazy. They were doing moonsaults off of them, like springboard moonsaults, when the ropes were going down like a foot. It was <laughs> That's crazy. Nuts. All right, um, Tomas, what was the uh, experience for you, G-Raver versus Kodaka? Were you are, were you familiar with Kodaka when he was coming out, coming in from Japan and all that? How What was it like in the building for you? Uh, yeah, I'm a pretty big fan of Asami. He follow him and like I said, DDT, Basara, um, Big Japan, all that fun stuff. <clears throat> and I always really enjoy, usually, not to get too far off topic, his dynamic when he's over in Japan with Miyamoto and some of those tag matches when they wrestle people that are always like monsters compared to them like twin towers and like when he wrestles those guys it's always like not to use the very cheesy hot button or hot topic word like fighting spirit like he has like a very brawler small man kind of style and it's the match itself was it was fine i enjoyed it like everything there i told kevin was like bare minimum seven out of ten for me just because being there kind of made things more fun and more exciting but it was kind of slow but one thing i did notice is that asami seemed to be very comfortable i'm not sure if he's ever i don't think he's ever been to america to the best of my knowledge but he seemed very comfortable playing to the crowd like he cuts his forehead he busts a light tube and he goes around like to the four corners of the ring like cutting um g raver's forehead and and but th- that was like act down, right? Like everyone's like, you know, over here, over yeah, here, and then he goes, over here, over here. That's yeah, he go, he goes around and does that, and he he was talking a lot. And if you kind of like watch him in Japan, not that he's bad at, at, by any means, but he kind of is more of stern almost. So it was kind of like a different side where you could tell he was really reveling in the fact that he was happy to be there. Like after the match, he like gets on the ropes and, you know, he, you know, does like the, you know, two hands up and everyone's like cheering. And that was one thing I was also surprised with is I've gone to a lot of the ROH new Japan shows and over the years, more and more people get popular, you know, cause obviously as wrestling gets more and more popular and things like that, you read up and stuff like that to the point where this year I saw Goto get like a crazy big ovation. And I was like, what? Like, this is <laughs> like, people like are really like watching this stuff now. And the same way with Asami was, he, I, I wouldn't say he's the biggest name by any means over there or over here, but as soon as like he came out, people blew up. They were chanting his name and they were buying his merch. And I thought that was that was something that was really really cool to see as like somebody who's been watching him for a couple years now. Not like you know the the biggest fan, but the match itself. There was that gnarly dragon suplex through the pane of glass. Um, that was really sick. The double knees were right in front of us. Like I was second row on that side of the ring, so that was really cool to see. But Drew, I think, mentioned it. There did seem like there was some miscommunication a few different times, and obviously, like language barrier is like always going to be a little difficult. But it's just kind of one of those things that was just like, mm, I get it. You know, it's it's hard. You know, maybe you don't know each other. You, you know, didn't have much time in the back for because of X, Y, and Z. But the match the match was fine. Much like Nick Gage. Um, before it was like Drew said, the valley, like, you know, ups and downs and they did the things they needed to do and people were excited and it was really cool seeing him have that kind of reaction in America. One last thing about Kodaka is that I think that um, whether or not 
they've had him booked for a really long time or it was more recent or whatever. I think the timing of bringing him over specifically was really perfect because um, B- Big Japan matches and uh, – um, indie Jap- Japanese matches right now, it's weird where they all, um, in some ways, their audiences are bigger than ever, but in other ways, they don't permeate uh, the general wrestling landscape as much as they would have previously, because I think that there's so much wrestling going on. So, like, maybe you have more people following these promotions, but if you're not following it, you might not really be exposed to these different matches. But the... Uh, Kodaka Takeda match from June is a rare match that I think really did bust out beyond just the um, the the niche audience already, and so um, I think that most people have seen that match. So it was really good timing to bring in Kodaka after it. Like if he had come in uh, earlier in the year in March or April or whenever, I don't know if his reaction would be as big and I don't know if there's nearly as much buzz around him. So it was, it was a real, uh, get for GCW to bring him in right at that time. Cause like they brought in Nueki from Japan in June and like people respected him because he was a Japanese guy, but it didn't seem like that many people there really were familiar specifically with him. And uh, Kodaka has a little bit more of a reputation, but still, I'm not sure how different it would have been otherwise. Right. And actually, I was just I was trying to think about it. When they brought in Ueki at the time, I don't remember if he was champion or not. Nope, um, he, he's not he been the not. champion. No, I mean even just having like tag belts or whatever, not even oh, like, yeah, yeah. actual like the the deathmatch title. But um Nope, he had, he didn't have anything. So yeah, he was so just like his level big of Japan pop- guy. Yeah, his level of popularity wouldn't have been I mean either way, I mean as Tomas was talking about it and and saying like that, you know, Asami is at a certain level uh, in the Japanese scene, I think that's fair to say. But I do think that he is a He's a guy who has a fervent following uh, within, like, a, the American kind of, uh, let's say, hardcore wrestling intelligentsia, to give a little bit of a shout-out to a, another wrestling podcaster, um, who do kind of talk a lot about uh, Asami Kodaka. I mean, for good reason. The guy's very talented. He's got a mm-hmm. great look. I mean, for a deathmatch guy, he's just super adorbs. Like very cute for a deathmatch guy so that's always a plus um plus the shit that he can pull off we talked about it with me and drew um it feels like hours ago at this point um when me and drew were talking about like the his his skill and talent um comparatively the guy is like he's really kind of like a triple threat in a lot of ways on top of the fact that he can wrestle um when you talk about his tag team um like he's also doesn't necessarily always have to do deathmatch work um so the crowd being really receptive to him it was would not necessarily be a shock to me, but I also do understand, like, you know, you get that level where you kind of, you think of someone at, at, at a certain place because of your fandom, and you're like, well, I'm hardcore, but, you know, and I know about this guy, but the rest of this crowd probably isn't going to know who the fuck they are. Um, which is like, I've been in that in that position like a shit 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 Promotional consideration paid for by the following. Hey, pro wrestling announcer Kevin Kelly here. I want to make sure you are all subscribed to all the great feeds here at Place to Be Nation. It's really easy to do. Just head to iTunes or your preferred podcatcher app today and search and subscribe to the Place to Be Nation wrestling feed, which, of course, includes the full archives of the Kevin Kelly Show, the Place to Be Nation pod feed, and the pro wrestling only feed. Subscribe, listen, and then rate us and leave feedback today. And be sure to give Justin your true thoughts. I mean, don't hold back. After all, he is kind of a jerk. Just listen to Scott. Scott. 
Place Feed Nations, JT Rosero and Chad Campbell here. We want to let you know that we have a ton of great podcasts available to you on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and PlaceFeedNation.com. We offer them to you on two great feeds. On the Place Feed Nation wrestling feed, we bring you the Mothership, the place to be podcast, along with main event, Survey Says, the Monday Night Wars, and our monthly pay-per-view reaction show, as well as Jeff Learns Wrestling. In addition to these full-length shows, we also deliver special network podcasts and pod blasts on topics old and new. Over on the Pro Wrestling Only feed, we dive deep inside the wrestling business with a stacked army of experts leading the way. The feed features potpourri shows such as This Week in Wrestling, Greetings from Allentown, Match of the Week podcasts, and the Military Industrial Suplex. We also have shows that focus intently on certain topics like Through the Years, Worldcast, Strong Style History, Strong Style Story, and Mount Olympus. Plus, the feed has the full archives of legendary shows like Titans of Wrestling, Where the Big Boys Play, Letters from Center Stage, and Letters from k plus much more. And on our very popular Place to Be Nation Pop podcast feed, we offer such great shows as Talkin' Pop, the Glenn Butler Podcast Hour Spectacular, NBA Team, PTBM Play, Sunday Groove, Breaking Balls, and Lucha Undead, as well as a vertical podcast heaven for comics fans with the hard traveling fanboys, Sellers Points, Todd Weber's Conversations, Geek and Sassy, and Marvel Age Podcasts. You can find all of these current shows, plus archives of our past podcasts, including the Kevin Kelly Show, as well by subscribing to both feeds on iTunes. And while there, be sure to rate and leave feedback today. All these shows, plus others, available at PlaceFeedNation.com, where we cover pro wrestling, sports, movies, comics, plus in-depth stretch projects, and more. Be sure to support our site by using PlaceFeedNation.com backslash Amazon when doing your online shopping, and download our free PTB Vintage Vault Refresh eBooks via the links on our site. We also want to thank our friends at Boneheads, Wing Bar in West Warwick, Rhode Island, and Fall River, Massachusetts, and the History of Wrestling.com. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr as well. PlaceFeedNation.com, the only place to be in your pop culture world. Believe me, there's no coming back to talk about the same match after what just happened. So, <laughs> fantastic! All right, so we're back, and uh, something just happened. It was fun for everyone involved, um, but the next match was not as fun, at least for me. Um, so the next match coming through is uh, Dysfunction coming back. Um, I don't know if he's been retired or just hasn't. He's wrestled at least in one. Like, when they do the Midwest, he definitely did Milwaukee. Uh, they did Milwaukee a year or two ago. And uh, he wrestled there. I think he was there in there. I don't remember if he was on the Chicago card at lot, at, or not. But he's done at least a little bit with them and has some sort of relationship. Yeah, and he has actually been wrestling. Because I see thirty over 30 matches in 2018 already. Um, and then what, is it, what do we got? Um not that many matches. Okay, so he's like toned down, but he's wrestling about thirty matches per year. It looks like um, for the past couple of years. So he's not. I mean, that's pretty good, even for active wrestler, active indie wrestlers at this point. But the way they're talking about him is like it sounded like he was completely retired, which I did not think was the case. But he's definitely not at the level that he was, you know, even just a few years ago, like four or five years ago. Um, let alone like you know long ago in his career where he was actually, you know, dysfunction was actually like, I. Uh, I wouldn't say he was, like, a big deal, but he was definitely pretty well-known um, in, like, the early 2000s um, as, like, not necessarily... Well, Deathmatch and then, like, Deathmatch adjacent kind of guy. And he's going up against who I have openly said is my least favorite wrestler on the planet, Marcus Crane, um, who I just can't stand for some reason. Um, in a match that I felt like the gimmick hurt the match quite a bit, honestly. Um, I always find that these kind of matches hurt, um, like coffin matches but like coffin matches i think in the big setting wwe kind of situation can kind of work but um but anytime i've seen someone try to do any kind of like coffin based matchup on the indies especially in a deathmatch setting it always it just comes across really shitty and this one i felt like really didn't work with the dry ice and they're digging through picking out pieces of dry ice which I get dry ice as a weapon for the concept of like it being painful, but it's definitely not a great weapon for the like watching it as a crowd because you're like getting long sequences of a guy just pushing a piece of dry ice onto someone's shoulder, which to me is not dynamic and doesn't look viscerally violent in any way. Um, and like with the smoke and the the kind of like um, 
the way that the sight lines work, you don't necessarily always get a good, clear vi like vision of it, so it doesn't work. I mean, I'm even one of these people who, like, you talked about Kodaka jamming the light tube into the guy's forehead. Stuff like that even kind of, like, grades on me a little bit, um, even though it's, like, a little bit more visceral where you're actually getting, like, light tube stabbed into forehead kind of violence. Um, so when you're then doing it with, like, a chunk of dry ice, it just does not work for me. So I felt like this match had a big... A uh, hill to climb for me already with the fact that I'm not a Marcus Crane fan and dysfunction is like um, clearly on the back nine of his career. Uh, it also had a gimmick that I said that I felt like really hurt it quite a bit. Um, but uh, I don't know. I'll go with Kevin. Kevin, like, uh, why was I wrong? Why was this match good? Or what did you think of it? I'm going to defer on this one because I want to talk about the next match first so badly okay. that uh, I'm going to give somebody else this one first. It was fine. Okay. <laughs> like like uh the dry eyes uh, the whole time i was just like oh that seems very dangerous even though i'm watching people get thrown off buildings and light tubes jammed in their foreheads i was just like how are they gonna do this this seems you know very not safe but uh all in all it was i think for probably watching is a little bit harder obviously everyone there was like shocked every time anything happened with dry ice because you know it's just like we were talking about it's one of those things that it's dangerous to handle um it was pretty gnarly when he like dumped him into that like what was it like a wooden door with big skewers sticking out of it he like dumps him into the corner with that that was pretty gnarly uh but i mean other than that it seemed like it got cut short because i don't know when it happened but marcus crane definitely got like a half dollar size like hole right near his kidney and i don't know if you guys noticed not to get to jump to the main event but when he comes out in the main event he's got like tape wrapped around like his lower abdomen and like that's what was covering it but i mean i don't know i i didn't know who either of these guys were the other guy dysfunction i do believe is that was the other guy not marcus yeah that guy was just kind of like he just looked like he might be at like a flea market like drinking a beer and he loves wisconsin whatever that's cool and Marcus mm -hmm. Crane, oddly, oddly enough, I saw him wrestle in 2015 at an AAW show. And the only reason me and my girlfriend noticed it was because we saw his, like, V for Vendetta tattoo on his side. And he just looks like a smelly guy who would, like, hang out at, like, a local, like, punk, like, crust venue. And it was, it was, it was fine. It, yeah. I'll let Drew if Drew has if Drew has anything else to say he can he can Drew's master the only guy put it I think together. Save this match for me. <laughs> um, but yeah, the big chunk that comes out of his side is on the Death Valley driver into the log cabin, which is you know again plays into the like um, the dangerousness of the dry ice. The dry ice didn't even take anybody's skin off like it was supposed to. But Drew, maybe you can make me uh, buy into this match as being good. Uh no, because I didn't think it was very, <laughs> I didn't think it was good either. No, I I don't I don't like Marcus Crane. I, I respect anyone that does death matches as a way to make a living or entertain people or whatever, but I I think he's very bad. Um, I'm not not a big fan. I don't I don't like his. I am a big. I know I joke about steroids a lot, but I am like a big look guy. Mm -hmm. Like I think a wrestler has to like. Oh, you know really, I am too. Oh yeah, of course I know you are, Tomas. <laughs> Um, but like and, a, a guy has to have a good look or a, a wrestler has to have a good look. And like, I, th I do think this actually could have been really cool and interesting as a way of like, um, if it was worked like entirely around the coffin and the, there was like these big teases and like these dramatic ways of like reaching in and getting the dry ice out or like some sort of sense of urgency or something, but it was just kind of meandering and weird and, you know, I don't know. There's so much, so much of, so much of deathmatch wrestling is, is gestures and facial expressions and like movements and urgency and like even like the way you step and walk and like play to the crowd and elevate the crowd and all that and it's just no, no, no. didn't get any of that here really. That's a good point that you talk about that because I think people think of deathmatch wrestling as just you know big crazy things happening after crazy thing happening. And what hurt this match and what I think hurts a lot of the coffin style matches, like I said, why I don't like them is that they don't tease it enough. And this match, it was like if they would have they could have gotten away with not putting a single piece of dry ice in the coffin, but just tell me that they did or put one piece of dry ice in the coffin and then yeah. just tell me that it was filled with it and then just pay the whole match teasing it and teasing it. And then when they finally hit the big spot into the dry ice, 
you have a bunch of smoke come out and it goes crazy and then the whole crowd would lose their shit and you didn't actually have to do anything but instead yeah. like from the opening bell they're digging around in the coffin they're throwing dry ice all over the ring and it's like they lose the the whimsy of professional wrestling which is like like you said, like teasing things and making facials and building it. And they more go into the idea that like, I want to prove to everyone that I'm willing to do stupid shit. And it's like, that's not the point. Like I'm not watching this to see who's the most badass person or not even badass, but like who's the most willing to hurt themselves person on the planet. Like I'm trying to get invested in the story of a wrestling match. And, and I mean, I think, I think that is like, even, I think that's a valid, like I'm going to, you know, I want to prove how much pain I can take. Like, I think there is an element of that, like to, to death matches, but like make it, make it violent feeling or make it urgent feeling or do it with, you know, like if they, if they would have gone the total other way and it's just like, we're just going to go nuts with the dry ice and they're just like chucking it at each other and just like frantically digging around and all that, like then go that way too. Cause that, you know, I'll watch that, but it's like right. this kind of middle ground of, slowly kind of like like there was one there was a spot that it was like marcus crane it was just a static shot of him digging in the coffin and putting pieces of dry ice on the slope uh, <laughs> uh, like on the lid of the coffin and just watching it slide down and slowly run into dysfunction on the ground it was like <laughs> okay <Yes. laughs> it's and it's funny you guys have mentioned the coffin specifically because they had like six dudes because you know what i mean like it's pretty big it's a monster size like bring it in and then like no one really knew what was going on and then like <laughs> you see them bring it out and then they put it in and for before the match actually started the ring had like a really sick aura of like there's this big monster box and the dry ice is like you know the smoke is like seeping out of it yeah so, which is so, awesome yeah, so before it felt like, oh, dude, like, like everything we were, you guys were just talking about, like, they didn't need to shove it down, like, Dysfunction's pants and, like, drag it across the forehead. Like, it could have very easily just been light tube. I, I will say I liked Marcus Crane's riot thing, the riot shield with the light tubes, but, like, I think he even tried to use it and, like, they didn't break. But it's like it could have just been, like, light tubes, whatever, whatever, the skewers than the coffin and it would have been sick but instead like we just all discussed it's just a lot of fumbling around and it just i don't know i fe it felt like when people who don't like american deathmatch would be like oh like this is like this these are the kind of guys you know what i mean like sloppy yeah. looking not body guys fumbling around and just like senseless violence where i know kevin's excited to talk about it but that's why i latch on to takeda and his reign so much is because there's so much happening there's meaning there's excitement there's a sense of like i've never seen this before and i'm sure we'll talk about that so not to get too far ahead yeah. of myself no, 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 you're, <laughs> no you're right and and crane crane is a guy who's got pieces because you talked about the riot shield super cool thing but it's always better in theory than it is in practice it always looks good when he brings that out especially when he puts the the, the light tubes on it but it never works like he never i've never seen him hit somebody with the light tube riot shield and actually have the light tubes like bust and break and do something cool and then he's got like the feathers and the whole thing on his like entrance gear because he's a crane right and the bird kind of play off even though like the feathers are black and cranes are white but whatever we're not you know there's been enough race talk on this show we don't need to get into that anymore <laughs> um but like the guy just he just doesn't ever deliver to that that level where i get into it but kevin wants to talk about the next match really badly so much so that, like, unless, Kevin, unless you have, like, some talking point about this match that we're all missing and why it's good, let's just get into the next match. And I was No, my only the, thing like... is the Go idea ahead. of dry ice is interesting. In the first minute I was engaged, and then they were just juggling it around because they didn't really want to touch it, but they <laughs> felt like they had to, and it just made it awkward. Right, which, I mean, there's some other things that I could reference to that being very similar to, but I'm not going to because I'm a gentleman. Um so, Kevin, let's get into the next match here because you really wanted to talk about it. So what I'm going to yes. do is, as the host is I'm going to take liberties with you right now. And I'm going to talk yes. about the match before you just because <sighs> I'm the host and I can't and I'm interjecting. No, tell me about it because this <laughs> match, as soon as it was getting going, Alex Cologne looked like he was fucking ready. He seemed like a bigger star than he's ever been in his entire career just making his entrance here. And then the man comes out next and we get into this. So, Kevin, tell me about it. Yes, yeah, so – um, first, Masashi Takeda, I believe, is a real legitimate wrestler of the year candidate. I don't think that it's getting talked about enough, and I think 
when it gets talked about, people kind of write it off as him just being a deathmatch guy or talk about him being a, you know, low level re- wrestler of the year candidate. No, he is not. He's legitimate, one of the best in the world. Um, he's a top three, top five wrestler of the year, without a doubt in my mind. Uh, his current Big Japan and Freedom. Uh, we'll call it a joint title range, even though or title uh, reign, even though um, they are separate. But I'll combine it. Uh, is I think it's reaching legendary status. I would compare it to. I'm not going to say it's better or worse, but I would compare it to the Kobashi 2003 through 2005 uh, GHC reign. I'd compare it to we what a lot of people would call about like Okada's last year. I really think that match in match out like night in night out. Um, he's really bringing a real aura to his titles. He's bringing a real, um, you have to see each one of the matches, even if it's not as good as some of the other ones. Like he had a match with, uh, Miyamoto Kodaka's partner in August. And like the match was decent, but still like, You have to see it and you have to see how it ends and just everything about him. He's must watch. If you are not, if you have not seen him, whether you like death matches or not, I think that he's a guy that really transcends the genre and is just uh, out of this world right now. And I do think it's a shame that people will pigeonhole him as being both a Japanese indie guy and as being a death match guy and that he won't get the uh, respect that he deserves this year. But I truly think that he is that very few guys have been better than him. And then also Cologne is a guy where over the past, I guess two years or so he's really stepped up. And I think that he is probably the most underappreciated guy on the U S deathmatch team. Um, he really delivers. And whenever he's put in a sp- good spot, he had a great match with Danny Havoc, a light tubes match a tournament of death. A few years ago, he was Danny Havoc's final match in CZW. Um, I think that he probably should have gotten a little bit more, uh, respect there in that company in gcw he kills it night in night out he had uh the great match with g raver that we mentioned he had an incredible match in uh against cyclope from tournament of survival where he took a curb stomp through tubes and was just bleeding like you've never seen before like just gushing blood and he's just he's really uh i think he is maybe the best actual wrestler in the u.s deathmatch scene right now nick age is king and you know nobody will go you know surpass him but i think as far as having good matches cologne is uh really in a league of his own so uh he's been asking for this match for a while i thought they were gonna maybe build it off wrestlemania weekend blow it off wrestlemania weekend i was surprised that they did it here but um the atmosphere was there people i think really were into Takeda. He really did seem like he had an aura, but it also seemed like people were there to see Cologne kind of step up with him. And this match was just crazy. Cologne is really great at these um, kind of sprinty death matches, and that's exactly what this was, and where uh, Takeda is really good at them too. So it just really worked. Like There was an insane spot where Takeda, right, uh, he caught Cologne, who was doing like a tope through the or just a suicide dive through the ropes and countered it into like a suplex through tubes that were in between two ladders that was just nuts there was a crazy move where uh he i'm looking so i don't get it wrong but uh cologne did or sorry takeda did a spider belly to belly suplex off the turnbuckle through tubes and cologne no sold it stood up and grabbed the tree that was in the room and just chucked it right at a hang takeda and it was so fucking awesome like the I, crowd the crowd went nuts for that yeah, yeah the, crowd the crowd went had nuts been chanting for that tree the whole fucking night it felt like they yeah. kept chanting why for wouldn't tree. why wouldn't they somebody yeah. randomly just brought that in during the in between of the matches <laughs> and i literally so i literally crazy. watched it happen it was a du- it was a dude in a luchador mask that i don't know where he got it from because it's literally just parking lots all around that foreman mills and like he dragged it and slid it in and before the match i do believe cologne takes it out and then the room is like tree 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 so then he brings it back in and not, not to cut it off but i just wanted to give yeah, you guys yeah, yeah. the Please, but somehow so with that's... all 
with all that backstory about the tree and the crowd being into the tree, they utilized it at the exact perfect moment where to get the maximum reaction out of it. And it was just genius. Like and if they had used that tree, both these fuckers that they yeah. did the tree. Cause that tree looks so goddamn gnarly that I couldn't imagine anyone using it. And yeah. then when he did, and he it was chucked it at him. Fuck. It was nasty. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah, it's just, like, that spot kind of encapsulates everything that is great about this match. Like, there's all sorts of stuff that happened before and after. Just nonstop balls to the wall. Um, but this is – this this match was just great. It was the best match on the show. It's probably the best match, um, the best American death match this year. Uh, it's just incredible. And I think that Cologne is a guy – we were talking about um, guys who could match up with Kodaka earlier – and I don't think that Cologne should have wrestled him or whatever. But I think that Cologne is a guy that is as good as anybody, either of the Japanese guys on the show. And I think that he is one guy that I would really love to see get a chance in Freedoms or Big Japan or whatever. Because I really do think that he is just at a notch above everyone else and just has no fear, goes balls to the wall, just sprinting does it all and i think that he's really underappreciated in the current like deathmatch boom i think that people maybe are realizing how good he is but he doesn't really have he hasn't really transcended beyond the bubble and i think that he is the one guy that really does deserve it because he puts in maximum effort every single time yeah and at cologne's grizzled just nearly geriatric age of literally two years older than me um (laughs) but in deathmatch years he's like 60 the guy fucking moves and like the way that yeah. he works this match at the pace with Takeda who, I mean, Takeda is not really ne- like a spring chicken when it comes to deathmatch wrestling either. You know, when you really think about it, both these guys give way more than they need to here. Um, or not necessarily way more than they need to, but way more than you could necessarily expect from them. Um, Oh shit. I didn't even realize Takeda and, and Cologne are the, exactly the same age. Um, <laughs> But, uh, like, this match was a masterpiece of the work of Takeda when it comes to, like, work. Me and Drew were talking about it with the match before. When it comes to kind of, like, putting um, some drama into what's fucking going on. And, like, the whole point of wrestling is, like, you know, to me, I'm, I'm like a Bret Hart guy. I always have been a Bret Hart guy. And not just, like in that when I was a child, I was a fan of his wrestling, but, like, I also buy into his concept of psychology of wrestling, which is, like, that you should be trying to get the most out of the least. And that sounds crazy to say in a match between these two, but Takeda really shows that because everything he does has that little extra bit when you talked about showing it to the crowd. And one thing that stood out to me, and it was, like, kind of the beginning of it, and then it continues through more spots, is that... He does the dig the light tube in the guy's head spot that I kind of like not a big fan of. He's doing it outside around the ring, but he caps it off with a just a little flick, a little flick of the light tube at the end. So he's digging it in there and he's getting deep with the, oh, I'm really working this light tube. And like I said, I, I, I don't necessarily always buy into it or even care about it. But then at the last little bit, he just kind of flicks it off in a way that feels real. Like he yeah. just he, was carving out a little divot of the guy's forehead on and, top and of the like, carving. When, yeah, I was just gonna say his the way that he carves is, it was just funny to describe it like that. But the way that he does that is really a trademark of a, a lot of his matches, whether he does it with tubes or with scissors or which I forgot to mention in this match, knives. Yeah, um, Ginzu knives. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 he's really um, good at turning that from a just a normal death match. Uh, rest spot, staple spot. He's really good at making it seem just slightly gnarlier than uh, your normal yes. spot. When he takes the scissors, he really works them in there and digs them in. When he does the knives, you think he's actually blading somebody's forehead with knives. Like, he, he does a better spot where even if you see it in every single deathmatch spot, Matt, or every single deathmatch, sorry, um, you still cringe a little bit when he does it, just a little bit more because there's just a real... And also, he's really good at maximizing his facial expressions at the same time. So it just... It just uh, it all comes together, and he, he does it better than basically anybody else. That's it. I mean, that's it. That's where I was going next. It's like, he does the light tube, he does the flicking of the carving of it at the end of the light tube dig that really makes it 
feel real. Like he's taking a divot out of this guy's fucking forehead meat. And then he gets into the ring after that and he grabs these fucking kitchen knives. And they're cheap shit kitchen knives that you buy at Smart and Final or whatever. But the way that he sharpens them against each other, big, huge motions playing to the top of the arena even though he's in this tiny room. And then he drags them across Cologne's head and just digging in there as you talk about it, He's got the two fucking knives on the top of this guy's forehead and he's digging in there. And Cologne's facial expressions, are, again, are playing to the hilt over the top. The guy is just... Cologne did everything he could to put Takeda over and that's like the huge sign of respect. I talked about this once randomly and it always sticks in my head. Red Dragon uh, were in Japan in the, the World Tag League in New Japan, wrestling against, um, Kazu fucking, uh, um, god damn it, now I can't even think of the, the name, but the, uh, the Gracie Killer, I can't remember his name, where's the mask, um, Sakuraba, Sakuraba, yeah, um, they're going up against Sakuraba and whoever his tag team partner was at the time, which might have been fucking Toriyano, and the respect that Red Dragon showed Sakuraba was, like, through the roof in this random house show tag team match on the world tag league that no one would give a fuck about and it was like you know respect what? That he I, re- I remember that match yeah and doesn't they, it uh, stick out kyle, kyle o'reilly kyle o'reilly and him um they like grappled for a while right that was yeah. that was like a big part of the match yeah yeah sorry yeah, it's like, sorry to that kind of that was, was, yeah that kind of respect shines through and alex cologne was giving that same level of respect here to cicada with everything he was doing he's making it over the top and then another, just one more key spot that I'll mention, and then I'll pass this off to whoever wants to go next. Um, so you guys can decide amongst yourselves. Um, but the, the other key spot was the big senton to the floor with the, the plate of glass across the ring ropes and all this. And Takeda, that's kind of the, the, the magic and the beauty of Takeda, is that he can make the most out of the least, and that's like my Bret Hart side of like why I love wrestling and the psychology of wrestling is get the most out of the least but he can also get the most out of the most which is like the kind of visceral 2018 what is wrestling all about spot 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 um that he, he did a senton from the top rope to the floor everyone else has done spots throughout this tournament at this point but that move was I think to me the biggest and the craziest and it was just fucking wild and like dr- diving off the top of that little like room building thing didn't feel as insane as that big spot that he did so the guy just he really it, it, it was delivers. timed perfectly yeah it's like he, he built it up like perfect to, yeah yeah so one, true. I one mean, if you get thing, into... oh. sorry. One last thing that I just remember too is what we talk about. What you were talking about, maximizing things. Uh, in this match, there was a kick out at one spot that I mentioned with the spider suplex, and the crowd went crazy for it. And one thing that I noticed that I forgot to mention with the rest of the show is this is the third match that that happened in. It happened in the first match and the second match where somebody did the kick out of one spot, and like. Gage did it, and also in the Jimmy Lloyd match as well. So this was the third time, and I thought that it was a bit unnecessary for those other guys to do it, especially in the first match. I kind of noticed it right away. But here they did it, and it all worked perfectly, where the crowd got you got the maximum. It was like a perfect kick out of one spot. The crowd went crazy. It was transitioned into something else that worked just as well, and it was great. So the other matches, it was maybe overused, but here it was perfect. So, Drew, I, I want to hear from you on this because I think we've already – we're gushing. I mean, me and Kevin both loved this thing. Easily the match of the night. Easily for me the match of the tournament without question. Um, probably definitely the match of the show, the match of the night. I don't think anything comes close. The My second favorite match is, like, very good but not on this level. Um, what, do you, what do you have to say about this masterpiece? I mean uh... – uh, honestly, I don't have much to say because you guys kind of already <laughs> said everything. Yes. I, I mean, both guys, I mean, Takeda's incredible. Alex Cologne, I mean, was right there with him. Like, I, I, I don't know, like Kevin said, I mean, Alex Cologne was awesome. Like, I, I, I think that shouldn't go unnoticed. I mean, he was right there. And, I, I mean, it was, they did all the crazy moves you can think of. But when it comes down to it, like they were they were working like real deal pro wrestlers work, like with the facial expressions and timing and 
you know, play into the crowd, all that stuff. Like that's, that's real work. You know what I mean? And that's what makes it, you know, really stand out from other kind of uh, similar matches. And I think Tomas can, you know, he'll, he can probably agree with this, that, I mean, Takeda talk about like a guy with an aura and that's a guy that his music hits and I get chills every single time. Like it's just, he's, I don't know. He's really something special. And I was, you know, as you guys know, I was lucky enough. I got to see him uh, live in Japan a couple times over the spring. And it's like, I don't know, get being, being able to see him live and hear that music hit. And yeah, he's, uh, he's awesome. I mean, he's, you know, one of the best wrestlers in the world and Alex Cologne, who's, you know, pretty unknown to a lot of people, uh, D- delivered just as good as he did. So it was, it was awesome. Like, what, a, what, a, what an awesome match. It's like everything, everything you want. Like you guys said, it's got, they maximized everything. They minimized everything. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It was awesome. Yeah. And Tomas, I, I feel like I, I feel so bad giving you the slim pickings, but you do have the live <laughs> experience to, uh, to kind of play off of as well because you were in the room with the the, the god, the uh, the wrestling. Yeah, you got to see him live. Yeah, I got to put my I got to put my hand on his shoulder when I took a photo with him. Did you get yeah. any of that blood? No, no, before the show, before the show. Damn. And but, all right, not Go not ahead. to bra- not to brag, but I do have a piece of glass that fell out of his back. <laughs> I told I told Kevin I told Kevin I took home like a broken light tube for it's like a it's like the top half of one I took yes. it home because awesome. because I thought of you, Dude. but um, yeah I mean obviously like the match itself is was fantastic it was the match of the night for me the match of the tournament whole nine yards but before that I'm just gonna harp on what Kevin said because I feel the exact same way and I'm gonna go a step further and I'm not gonna say he's five or three in my opinion he is the best wrestler in the world and since when was that I do believe it was last year December 17th against uh Takahashi in Death Vegas to me is when I first kind of was glued to it because this was a guy who can wrestle this is a guy who has like a beautiful flying uh arm bar who can strike with the knees the physicality as well as spider german somebody <laughs> like uh threw a pane of glass and like cut the back of the neck like the blood was so bad and then you think of what does he had? He has two singles titles and a tag title all between like this year run. So, and then he also has the DDT stuff that I'm sure Drew knows, like the, uh, Mahi Manji, like live stuff. And, um, Which as well awesome. as that, man, oh, man. so good. He that drops poor Mao off that van. <laughs> it's, but, every, but, and <laughs> it's, and so he, he has DDT, he has freedoms, he has big Japan and everywhere he goes, it's everything you guys are saying. It's like there's something different. I watched Ab- Abdullah Kobayashi get superplexed onto a bed of nails. I've seen him apply a cross arm breaker and saw a man's wrist off. I've seen scissors, knives. I've seen contraptions that seem like Spanish Inquisition torture level stuff. But every single thing, and I think one thing that kind of gets lost in wrestling, and I see people like harp on with like Okada, is like there's a formula, right? Like this is this is what he wants to do in these um, specific parts of the match. And every single Takeda match, yeah, he has, you know, like the high spots, the running knee with, you know, the tubes in the chest or stuff like that. But everything feels different than the last. And that's so hard to do in this day and age where everyone is watching your matches. at Like as soon as it makes tape, people are already watching it. People are already gifting it. And there's sent on to the floor like we were talking about when he caught Cologne, tossed him through the like that. And the knives, it's it's there's so much to it and everything he does is so good and the most important thing to me that I get swept up in his matches is how absolutely well he controls the crowd when he wants mm-hmm. them to cheer when he wants them to get excited that that is absolutely infectious and and when Drew saw it in Kirk and Hall and when I saw it in 
behind the form and mills <laughs> it's like <laughs> when when he wants you to get excited you're, you're you're completely swept up in what he's doing and and then you're completely blown away by what you're seeing like if it's like i said the knees or like the match with asami where he took like the double knees off the top or he gave him that like insane i don't even know what it was like that to finish the asami match he gives him like that gnarly like reverse like I don't even know what it was. He plants Asami, but like the physicality mixed with the violence and and I I don't care who it is. I watch everything. I watch a lot of things in Europe, Japan, America. Kenny, Walter, Zack Saber Jr. To me, Takeda has been the best wrestler for almost like a full calendar year. And the last thing I'll say is he also has like a tag element to him that can you say Okada can do that? Well, we don't really know. This guy can work singles, he can work tag, he can work deathmatch, and he can work a normal wrestling match, and that is so rare. Because we were just talking, like, everyone's talking about how great this Alex Cologne guy is, right? And how he's kind of trying to take it to the next level. This guy is at that next level, and he's making these belts mean something. When he loses, like, just that match against Jun Kasai with the no canvas, like, that's... I was telling Kevin to me it's one of my favorite matches of the year because there's such a story there. That's student teacher, right? You know, big big thing, 20th anniversary, and he wins. And it, you know, it's like it means so much that he has this belt, and the match was great. There's nothing else to really say about it. It was it also it was really fast. Like on tape, watching it, th- how fast they were going was like astonishing and how violent it was getting at every leg and then it finally like finished and you almost had to like take a breath because you were like holding your breath because it was like you're in a car barreling down the road with like no brakes and it was like the light tubes the knives you know like the the tree the star of the match the tree but i love this guy and it was such if if i hadn't seen him the night would still be really great but just hearing like drew was saying hearing that music really it just gets you excited like it I don't think he's obviously as legendary as Liger, but Liger's the only music that I've ever heard in real life the very first time I heard it hit that I felt something, and Takeda feels that way to me and how wrapped up I am in him as a champion. And it was rad, just super awesome to see it live. Like, you just can't replicate what he has currently. Perfect package. I'm not being hyperbolic about this at all. When he loses the Big Japan uh, death title, I'm going to feel empty. I'm gonna. It's going to bring out emotions that... Are, are, you know, like actual real emotions in in me in wrestling that are not just like, oh yeah, cool, he won, he lost. Like, I'm probably gonna sit at the screen and stare for a little while and just kind of think and maybe shed a few tears or whatever. Like, it's actually gonna, whenever it ends, it's gonna feel like a part of me is gone, and I'm not even like joking it's going to be actually an emotional moment because of how wrapped up and engaged in him and in his reigns that i am well dude you know what i think that is and he at the end of the show that we're talking about tonight he cuts a promo and he says something like it's like death match my life and like if you watch you know the big uh, big japan matches uh, the Takahashi match from Death Vegas and then the Kobayashi match at Endless Survivor. The video package, packages before that, they do a good job of outlining his career and how he was like, he wanted to be a deathmatch wrestler, you know, when he was a teenager. There's like the pictures of him with like, uh, you know, Kobayashi and Jackie Numazawa or whoever, you know, when he's a little guy. He's like, you know, a teenager. Like, that's what he wants to do. Like, he loves deathmatch wrestling. Like, he can do anything he wants you know he's not like some guys who they get into deathmatch wrestling because they're you know they it's like an easy payday or whatever you know i which i think that's kind of uh some of the argument that people have against deathmatch wrestling which is you know not really true a lot of the times but like he's a guy where it's like he believes in it and it's his, it's his life you know so it's like there's such a deep connection there and it's like there's such like a, a pride that uh you don't get with a lot of guys. For like yeah, I mean, he was an MMA thing. fighter for yeah. before, yeah, you know absolutely. what I mean? So it's like, yeah. he's not just a guy that's like, oh, like, I got really good, and, you know, this is what I'll do. Like, obviously, you know, he's not going to be a UFC champ, but it's like, this guy could do something else. And he yeah, probably, he's like a legitimate probably, athlete. Yeah, yeah, he'd yeah. probably be good at it, but instead it's like he implements that as well as, like, everything that I'm sure Jun Kasai has taught him. And, you know, it's it's like I said, it's truly like a perfect package of a guy right now. It can't yeah, be. He could, he could be doing, uh, you know, matches in front of uh, 
150 people for cocky ride shows, you know? Um, <laughs> right. He could be doing grappling <laughs> exhibitions uh, for Enoki's private federation that he runs in his backyard. Um, mm-hmm. But instead, Yo, of... I just thought of real quick. What if he's the in the cocky ride main event next year against Kakihara? Because you know, you, the gimmick is that everybody just destroys him. Yeah. What if maybe next year it's a death match? <laughs> oh, so yeah, fun. brilliant. Yeah, that really should happen because he could grapple with him too. Like he could rap, grapple with Kakihara, like, and they yeah. could have just a badass fucking match. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I, you guys, there's. I think we picked most of the meat from this bone here, um, but I mean, this is <laughs> I, fantastic. I mean, for me, I was bummed out when Takahashi lost the deathmatch title to to Takeda, but his reign has made it so fucking worth it that like it's like it's hard to uh, even remember a point when I was like upset about that. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it feels match... so. It's been going on for a year, but it feels like it's been going on for much longer. Yes, death, death, is... death, death Vegas is this weekend, by the way. Yeah, nice. And uh, and we talk. I mean, you guys got to pop up somewhere to review Death Vegas. I don't know where who would host such a review, but it feels like something that the you know Kevin and Drew have to continue to review. Um, you guys mm. have done Death Vegas what two three <laughs> years now at this point? Uh, would this be our third Death Vegas? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys got to review it that somewhere. Maybe we could talk to some friends um, and get that put up somewhere at least because I, I, I got to hear that Death Vegas review from someone. Um, well, I don't, I don't, match, it might be hard to hard to get a hold of. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, we'll see. The next match, um, I don't know if any of you guys have anything to say, but this is my second favorite match of the, of the night, and I don't know if anybody oh. else is like into it enough to where they Well, first to introduce the match. Yeah, yeah, so the next match is Isaiah Velasquez, um, probably, to me, the best freelance wrestling champion of all time, um, which is probably saying something because a lot of people really like uh, Mustafa Ali a lot, the Prince Ali. Um, but I, I always thought that Velasquez was a better champion just because I'm kind of a heel fan. And a guy who's becoming um, probably my... You talk about G-Raver uh, being kind of that mid-card champion people's champion level guy for gcw but to me the guy who's becoming like the the next big thing and probably the guy that gcw should be looking at as their next top guy uh kyle the beast uh just with the dynamic ability that he shows to be able to do anything these guys come out here and have just a fucking barn burner of a match that i mean non-tournament and feels like who's this fucking guy who's this guy what are they doing in this non-tournament bullshit death match and they come out and they fucking kill it so that's the next match here, and I don't know if anybody likes it as much as I do, but um, yeah, I don't. Know. What do you guys think? Do we want to talk about more than all, I do? All I really have to say about it is that I thought that it was a really good match, although I wasn't necessarily in the mood for a match like this on a show like this. Um, but I thought it was really good, and I do echo what you say. Um, Kyle the Beast this year, I think, has really turned into the guy for GCW that they use when they want somebody else to look good. Um, they use, Kyle, they put Kyle the Beast in that spot, and he delivers. He was in that four-way in uh, um, New Orleans or WrestleMania, and he was a really good base in that. Uh, Marco Stunt, Kyle the Beast is the reason why Marco Stunt is a thing right now. Yep. And... Uh, um, and then in this match as well, you have Velasquez, who, you know, the area probably knows, but GCW fans may not. And then uh, now he, he looks really good in this match because KTB made him look good. So, yeah, I, I think that he's a guy where um, last year and earlier in this year, I thought that he was just kind of a solid guy on GCW shows, but like was kind of shoehorned in. And now he's turned into really a vital part in the promotion. And especially it, as it continues to grow and kind of gets its own identity. I think that he's definitely going to be much more of a vital role as well. Yeah. And I think he's a guy who's polished himself now um, with like, he was looking for something that worked with the, the face paint and the gear and everything. And I think that now he's at the point where he comes across like a star right at the perfect time where, where GCW is getting the attention. So it's like he, he realistically, like uh, there are people who have probably seen him where he was like slightly embarrassing, 
looking but now i think it's the perfect time where like he's got something that's a coherent look and the promotion is actually getting eyes on it um and he's back to back i think back to back he's had i won't say show stealers but show stealing adjacent matches matches that over delivered left you with a really cool feeling coming out of it and were like actually good so it's like it's not just that i didn't expect this match to be this good but it's also like this match was actually good which is like kind of two different things um and a lot of his offense is fucking fantastic with the way that he is a beast i mean marco stunt is tiny isaiah velasquez also small but the way that he is able to manipulate these guys bodies around the ring around the entire fucking building uh i loved the power slam run into the or it was a gorilla press run into the post transitioned into a power slam back into the ring the step up power bomb spot is fucking killer the way that he steps up onto the the bottom rope into the power bomb feels like a stupid indie spot that like a guy would do on a dumbass indie show that you wouldn't care about but he pulls it off in a way that comes across like a cool power show off spot um really great stuff isaiah velasquez um like i said i think he presents himself holds himself like a star which helps make the match too uh isaiah velasquez from the moment he comes out to the ring he has the same cocky confidence that i said he had in freelance um which a lot of people not all wrestlers are able to transition from an area where they're well known where they're the champion where they're the top guy to a place where they're not known with they're not as well known to able to hold that same level of confidence in themselves which he does here even if it is a bravado and a character and whatever he's playing he comes out and he feels over the top he's from the get-go he's big dives attacking beast as he can great striking combinations from him with the back elbows and the attacks that he does really quick match really you know it's just a a non-tournament match that's meant to just like buffer in between death matches and all this but i thought that with the you know five minutes that they were given they fucking really gave me something here and honestly like i said this is my second favorite match on the show i mean these guys killed it um Thomas, did you have anything to say? How did you feel coming into this? Because I think this is probably two guys that you weren't super exposed to at this point. What did you think about this match, and what did you think about the way that they both presented themselves? Yeah, so, I mean, no disrespects to these two fine young gentlemen. I had absolutely no fucking clue who they were. But from the get-go, it was pretty balls to the wall, pretty physical, pretty kind of standard story of big guy, small guy, flippy guy, you know, power, you know, kind of thing. And they had like that dynamic and I thought they did it really well. And, um, you know, I, like I said, I'm not really aware on who these gentlemen were, but it, it was, it was good. I'm, I, I see where Kevin's coming from, but I actually kind of look at it on the flip side where I thought it was kind of like a nice refreshing, uh, palate cleansing kind of thing where it's like, you know, everything we just talked about in the first half was like I said, like it was like a sonic, like just blast force, like violence, violence, violence. And then, like, you get, they had, that was after, after the intermission. So it's like you had 15, 20 minutes to chill, go outside, drink some water, you know, like, whatever. And then you sat back down and you just saw two guys have, like, a good ass wrestling match. And I was kind of like, okay, you know what I mean? Like, I, I guess I don't need to see a person be thrown off a building right now to, to enjoy what I'm at. It kind of brought me back down to my senses, not so primitive. But all in all, yeah, it was, it was pretty rad. And then the dude, I was Kyle the Beast, correct? I don't want to, say it incorrectly yep. but he did that uh he did the bandito the, the body slam backflip thing and i was like holy shit that that big guy's moving drew give me your takes on this match what did you think uh i i don't have a lot of specifics about this match i really enjoyed it in the context of the rest of the show like tomas said as a palate cleanser let's kind of get the first round out of our minds for a little bit have something different uh and that's that's kind of about it. I, I like the dynamic, like Tomas said as well. Uh, the smaller guy who's more athletic versus the power guy. It's a really easy and effective story to tell. And I thought they did a good job. I, you know, I wasn't. I'm not familiar with uh, either of these guys, but yeah, that's that's about all. I don't I don't have a lot to say about this or the next match. Um, yeah, that, other that, than. Oh, just other than like I, I think these work really. These two matches work really well. This one especially uh, in relation to everything else on the show. And that feels like a fair takeaway coming out of the match, honestly. And it, like it's just my taste and the fact that I'm a fucking weirdo. That's why I like get off on a match like this because both guys, I feel like, are building 
and I have always been like a big fan of like building the next guy kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And sure, they just both are like coming out of their sh- not just coming out of their shells, but both like coming out of like their respective hidden places where more people or more people are going to notice how good they are. And this match, I feel like, really encapsulated that super well. Um, with the skills of both guys on display as a big man and a small man, but also like an athletic big man who can like really show off what he can do, and also like a a small guy who can also like strike in a way that's like believable, incredible. But okay, so this next four way, I honestly don't have a lot to say about it other than the fact that I thought that me neither. Really oh my together. goodness, what is wrong with you guys? Oh, <laughs> I, okay. oh my days. So Gringo Loco is my number two <laughs> least favorite wrestler on the planet, but I thought that Deppin did a great job here. But, you know, Tomas, tell me about this match. Okay. I'm sure it's going to be obvious what I'm about to say, but seeing PCO in real life is the fucking most insane thing. I Like, when the spring break thing happened and Kevin told me about it, I could not believe, I've, I've watched wrestling my whole life, that the motherfucking Quebecer is like this guy that's like back, and not only is he back, but apparently it's sick, and he's like trying to kill himself, and that's probably not like, maybe to some people, like cool to say, but like, he, so he comes out, and seeing him in real life, he's like the definition of like, an old, like, Mary time like buff guy like with the the cheetah print like a ball like he has like this specific look about him that's like so almost like archaic and wrestling nowadays where like a lot of guys are a bit smaller and even like Michael Elgin and Brian Cage like that are like real big guys they don't really look like PCO they have this he has this monster barrel chest and he just has like this presence about him that I was telling Kevin it's like mm-hmm. a relic of a time where when we were all growing up watching wrestling everything was supposed to be like believable these characters were supposed to be like larger than life and like unstoppable you know like he does like all the dumb undertaker stuff and like i'm sure watching if you don't care it's probably just like whatever but like seeing it and then like the stupid choke slam like tombstone i don't i don't know i guess it was like one of those things you just had to be there but it was like he try he does a moonsault off the top almost kills himself he does a reverse rana and like lands on his own head and it's it's probably like i said really bad to say but it's like he's killing himself at i don't know he's got to be like 50 something right and it's like i don't know nostalgia mixed with like what the fuck is going on there was like a taser and then like i said a double choke slam tombstone I, i don't know i can get it i can get why nobody wants to talk about it but like seeing it was like just definition of a spectacle and it was fucking rad i i loved it so, so where I'm at with PCO play. is that – oh, sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> I was just going to say where I'm at with, with him is that um, he's a great live spectacle. If you haven't seen him, seeing him for the first time is incredible. I was at the Walter match live, and then I was at uh, – saw him against Janelle too. And he truly is – it's it's an incredible live spectacle. Uh, him hitting moves, him barely hitting moves, just the total package – Everything works. Uh, where I'm at with him, though, is that once you see him a few times, it just kind of uh, – he still busts his ass and works super hard every time. But it kind of uh, – every time you see him is a bit diminishing returns. So now I've seen a few matches of his, and it doesn't feel as fresh and as special as it did in the beginning. So it, it just doesn't – he doesn't grab me as much as he did. Once you see him more than once, you kind of pick up on what he does, and it just it doesn't stand out as much. Yeah, I mean, I as Tomas was talking right now, I almost just DM'd someone to buy ticket a ticket for the first night of Bola because just to see PCO. Um, because as of right now, I'm only going to the second night and the third night, um, and I just want to go to the first night to guarantee that I can see that sweet, sweet PCO action. <laughs> and as Kevin started talking, I remembered why I don't give a fuck about seeing a PCO match. Um, and I don't know. I just – the live aspect of it seems important right now, right? It feels like something that might be historic, like the idea that you saw a PCO match on this weird second run of his career. Um, he does have something. There is something there. And in this match, I thought that this was one of his better presentations of what he does have. Um, That said, 
um, there is still those issues with, you know, that all this stuff. Drew, what did you think about yes. this four-way? You know, I don't really have any thoughts on it. Oh, shit. Sorry, buddy. Um, <laughs> I don't know where you're at. No, no. Kevin, did you give your takes on this? Uh, the, the actual match, I honestly don't have that much to say about it. Um, right. I watched it and there were tasers, but I don't really remember that much about it. All I have written on my notes was there were tasers, LOL. Yeah. And it's really, t- this match was tough for me because I, like I said, I'm not a Gringo Loco fan. I dislike Gringo Loco in a lot of ways. Um, especially because the, his gimmick with like the ace of base or whatever, uh, they call him the base God. Because it, it, to me, it's like a nickname that really like intentionally um, breaks kayfabe. Because it's really hard to explain like why a guy is the ace of base or whatever. It's like, oh, he's the ace of base, which means that like um, you know, he's really good at making wrestling moves look like other people are hurting him or whatever it is. Um, so that's like a tough one for me. But then Tony Deppen, I thought was fantastic here. And Tony Deppen's a guy who like sticks to kayfabe in a really great way. Um, I love, like, as the match is, like, breaking down and it's, like, an extreme match, Tony Deppen comes back with a light tube. Like, after everything we've seen with the tasers, not just in this match, but, like, throughout the entire night, it's, like, it's a big deal that he's got a light tube. Um, and it's just <laughs> one light tube and it's one big spot. And then it sets up for the finish, which is the the t- double or double chokeslam tombstone spot, which is just wild as fuck. Um and so like there's a lot of ways that this was presented perfectly the crowd was definitely um into it but also at the same time it's like it's really hard for the crowd to get like super invested because of just it feels it it really feels like the wrong place to have had this match and to even have this title change um in a lot of ways um but it was a good match and it was i think probably the the right title change because deppin's gimmick I think with the extreme title was working with the idea that he's like the anti extreme extreme champion. But now I think PCO can take this title to another place, but I worry that that other place is going to get repeatedly more and more goofy to the point where like the title becomes a joke and like something that I I'm just going to skip and not want to watch. Um, so we'll see where we go from there. But drew, are you back? I, yeah, I'm back. Oh, no, I'm, I'm back. Sorry. Wait, wait. What? Oh, was I? Was I not? Uh, the was way it that not you were talking enough? sounded like you were like far away from the microphone. I thought you were like oh, doing you know something. What? Yeah, I I had laid down. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Please keep laying. Please. Do you want to talk about well, this no. four way match at all? Me? Yes. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. I I don't really have any thoughts on it. How do you feel about PCO? Uh, I don't really have any thoughts on. PCO. <laughs> That's them, so. Drew doesn't want to talk about anything with this at all, and you guys are still <laughs> trying so hard. Drew, Drew, you feel like it, this is the way he's thing mentioned about... it at least four times yes. in the last match and this one. He tried to preemptively avoid talking about this match, and you still are trying it, to I'm do whatever you can. It. Is it this wrong is to have fun, Kevin, Drew. with my friend? <laughs> this is my is first my time friend? getting to talk to him. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I feel like Drew. I feel like you were like simultaneously the probably one of the like a big time pco hater but also like the guy that pco's resurgence is like built for like i feel like you like a certain era of retro wwf stuff but you also like miss like kind of the i don't know like modern indie fun that would come with like being into pco right now so it's just interesting to me like you have no interest in the pco resurgence right now no no, not really. I think it's cool, but I don't really care to see the matches. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I can't believe I, it for that. Yeah, I, I don't uh, – I have no attachment to, like, PCO as a Quebecer or anything. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So I should not spend $90 to watch a PCO match on Friday night. I didn't say that. <laughs> there will probably be more than a PCO match that's worth it. Yeah, right. Um, so, okay, guys, this is what we all came here for. This is the big showdown, the main event, the fatal uh, five-way that turned into a four-way. Um, and th- was it, was that just because Jimmy Lloyd hurt his wrist? Yeah. Yeah, that was yeah. because of the Jimmy Lloyd thing. And that that is going to play into, like, the overall booking of the shows in general that we'll maybe talk about at this point because I've already um, had 
too many beers. Um, so let's get into it. Let's see. Who wants – does anyone, like, really want to start out talking about the, the main event four-way here? Uh, I'll, I'll start out by okay, saying please. I don't have a lot of specific analysis of the match. All I want to say is that, I, I mean, Mar- you know, Marcus Crane was, he, he did feel a little out of place, but the opening spot with Kodaka and Takeda breaking light tubes over their own heads and then going after the other guys, it was like you had three guys in there that just had really, really crazy aura, out of this world charisma, and it just like, I, I just kind of sat watching it and it just those guys really get it they really know how to wrestle and it's awesome and that's that's all i want to say about that it's just really cool really cool to watch just sit back and watch that yeah yeah i mean just watching the opening the stoicism that yeah gage shows here the reserve that he shows the the boiling over rage that's coming out of nick gage in the entrances and in the beginning of the match, in the white sells... Jor- in the white Jordan jersey, no less. Yes, white Mike yes, Jordan. That he, um, that he almost died in uh, years ago. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and so Kodaka Kodaka gets the first introduction, and he shows his light tube sword, and that's it. You got Crane, who comes across like a the biggest fucking goob on the planet, and he's doing fucking jerk off motions with the light tubes. And then you get, yeah. If you, if you you okay. need if you need any other example on why he stinks, just look at the introductions. Yes, that's all you need for this match yeah. to understand why he shouldn't fucking be there and why like he should he yeah he just did not respect the gravity of the situation, and then he made it he almost could have ruined it with what he was doing. Um, it's just a guy like people that get it and people that don't. Right. You know. Yeah, and so Pretty then clear. you get to Takeda, and Takeda, he's got the, the, the light tube in his hand, the, the sword, the saber that he'll bring to the battle. But he's also, it's like, it's getting also, like, more stoic and more, like, serious about what's about to happen. And Gage, like, Gage barely fucking moves. <laughs> like, his introduction is the most, like, he is serious. <laughs> he's going to war. And he's, like, getting prepared for the fucking battle. And that's what it's about. Then it does pop off. And the second the match starts... That's why Marcus Crane doing the bullshit that he's doing ruins it even more. Because the second that the fucking match starts, shit is popping off. It's violence. It's insane. It's all over the place. There's so much fucking action within moments. And it's just like, be calm for a fucking minute. You know? Just like humble yourself to the situation that you're in and make this mean something but instead he's like playing around and then once it gets going there is violence and there is fucking blood and there's nastiness but the reason why I was going to talk about the booking and the storytelling and everything that's going on is that the collusion as they repeatedly talk about the collusion and the fucking the Japanese contingent with Kodaka and Takeda working together made this fucking match like when they get rid of Marcus Crane and then it's the two together against Gage and they've shown already a propensity to work together, it's like, this is what it's all about. This is my bread and butter. This is what I am into. I don't fucking care so much about the, the fact that they're using light tubes. It's like, this is, um, you know, there's like the Brian Alvarez wrestling observer. What does Vince McMahon want? He wants the Giants beating up the good guy. So you got Kane and the big show and they're attacking Roman Reigns, right? And it's oh my god, the unequivocal size of the two. And it's like the difference between that where it's like it's oh, it's because they're both big and then it's oh, it's because um these guys are fucking these vicious nasty Japanese guys. Like the difference there is like the story that they're telling and the connection that I have with the characters and what's happening here. I just so buy into this as the the story of the match moving forward um and just like get into them as these vicious monsters that gage overcomes as he continues to herculeanly valiantly overtake the the competitors that he's going up against um 
let's get into Thomas. What was your uh, Thomas? What was your uh, takeaway here live in the building for this final? Same thing as before. I mean, every single person that came out. I mean, I guess Marcus Crane aside, um, just monster reception, and it, it got louder and louder. Asami, Takeda, and then Nick Gage. <laughs> I remember Nick Gage was like walking in front of us, and like some light tubes like fell and like burst, and he's just the section we were in just like blew up. Like like I can't put enough emphasis on just like every little dumb thing he says and does. Like it's so eaten up at like such a feverish pace and. Um, like you're saying, everyone gets announced, and then, you know, uh, I mean, it was genuinely hard to kind of understand what was going on at first, because it was literally like someone set a bomb off, like, it, they took them to both sides of the arena, and I, I maybe Kevin can say it, or, like, Drew, but, like, light tubes are a lot louder in, like, person than, like, I feel like most people yeah. would, like, kind of yeah. think, <laughs> so. Yeah, that, that's what I, I, I kept meaning to ask you that, Tomas, yeah, <laughs> they're really loud, huh? Yeah, no, the only reason I knew about that is because my brother used to do backyard wrestling, so I've been around, like, plenty of light tubes and, like, popping and stuff like that, but it's, like, one thing all my friends were saying was, like, dude, that was way louder than, like, you'd expect, and it really was, so it's, like, like the, I don't even know how, it couldn't have been longer than a couple minutes, but, like, there's brawling on the far side, there's brawling close, and it's just, like, pop, 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 it's, like, the dust is, like, consuming the arena at this point, and, like, it was, like I said, it was a pretty small place, I don't know how game changer is like for kevin when he's there but second row there was light tubes and just shit falling on us like the whole time like if they oh, went, yeah, they go all over the place yeah like They're... if they went to our side of the ring it was bursting like all over so like this was like that times like five because they they did the, what did they do they tied the ropes off and then they just had them like everywhere outside they had like the jenga crisscross like logs um so and it was just insanity for like the first you know couple of minutes and then i thought there was some actually cool like tag stuff like the german throw you know kind of like into the german suplex um i think they also did like a if i remember correctly like a rolling like sunset flip thing off the top that kind of didn't yeah. really work yeah yeah but they, like they were trying and like that was all really cool and you got from the moment that like takeda and nick gage came out like i said it on twitter i was like if these guys face off like it's going to feel really big and it did. Like, when that moment came, when he pinned Asami, and, like, it was these guys, like, it was, like, the kettle was boiling. Like, it was, like, it, it was at a fever pitch, and I don't remember exactly what Takeda took, but, I mean, by the end of that match, there's, like, one spot where he takes it on the back, and he gets up, and there's just a thick, massive, like, pool of blood, and then by the end of the match, like, Nick Gage's whole head looks like he got, like, dipped in like cherry so like, it was the jersey was like an away jersey like i know drew said that i'm gonna take that yeah. like it started off as a home jersey it turned out to be an away jersey by the end of it and it was just I, i'll say like if you want to like break it down you know kind of like the alex cologne match i thought that was a bit like better as far as like but like this was just like the feeling like these are the two guys that people wanted to see square off like this is what we wanted to see and if maybe you could say like maybe nick gage is kind of chilling in the first match it got turned up to, like, 12, and it was, I mean, like, Takeda's, like, soaking in blood. I don't know if, how many people have seen, like, those, like, Burning Hammer photos, whoever that guy is, shout out to that dude, but he posted, like, the photo of Takeda, a massive, like, cut, like, down, like, his chest, and he's, like, soaking blood. Asami's trying to get the referee to wrap it up, and he's, like, telling him to go away, and then he, you know, what does every good top guy do? sends the crowd home happy. I think he said something like, you know, our English, no good, you know, but I love Deathmatch. Deathmatch is my life. Like, I love American Deathmatch. Like, I love GC fucking W and, like, pff, pace, place blowed up, like, right off, like, the roof, right out of the place. And, like, you could tell he, it meant a lot for him to be there and you could tell the crowd really, like, appreciated him saying that, him being there and him, like, going to the length that he did. And it was just awesome. It just capped off, like, a perfect uh, night for me. Yeah, and you know what what continued to happen throughout this this match? And you talked about it, like the importance of the violence of it, was that everyone repeatedly, not everyone, but like the people who got it, the people who are into and understand what the fuck they were doing here, um, which is why this is when the match of the show is honestly just Marcus Crane. Like Marcus Crane fucked this match up in a lot of ways. Um, and it would have been, I honestly would have been a lot happier with with jimmy lloyd in his place um 
is that they were working like it mattered. Like, stuff repeatedly fucking mattered. When Gage was setting up the face wash, it, he put the light tubes on him, and then he just went for the face wash. And then the light tubes missed, and they didn't bust or whatever. But it was like, it didn't matter because... The whole point was that he was do just trying to get from to the move and try to hit the guy and not like worried so much about setting everything up. And sometimes that like extra moment of setting up just comes across fake. And this just continuously came across feeling fucking violent. Um, to the Takeda is probably the greatest. This is like a dumb thing because you talk about like this guy is like on the level of wrestler of the year. This is a dumb thing to give him credit for. But he's the best person I've ever seen deal with light tubes. Especially because he does this, like, light tube chuck thing that nobody else really is able to pull off. Where he can just, like, throw a bunch of light tubes at a guy. Oh, it's so rad when he does it. <laughs> yeah, and the way that just, like, he throws a bundle of light tubes at someone and they all just shatter and rain down fucking violence and bloody murder is just... You know who, you know who he learned that from? Who did he get that from? The ace of every promotion in Japan, Abdullah Kobayashi. Yeah. The greatest. Yeah, the true the true ace of Japan. <laughs> yeah, he really is. But yeah, but, the, the, the light tube. But yeah, chuck. that, the chuck and the other thing that he does that looks insane is the knees with yeah. the light yes. tubes. Oh, that, so, it's so brutal live, man. Like just seeing yeah. it. Like there's, he goes, that's like one thing that I'll t say, and you can see it, like I was saying, with the physicality in his, a lot of his matches, but he it, and you also mentioned it, uh, Tim, before when some people kind of come over, maybe they don't go 100 percent, maybe 75, 80 or maybe, you know, they're not putting the stank, the mustard on the, the hits. I'm talking this guy was f pedal to the metal like these knees that he was like running into people were like hitting. And it was like, I, yeah, it's like, ooh, you know, you're already watching people get sliced up, but it's just like that extra that extra little thing like we we're all talking about. It's the little things. It's the fact that. Everything is real. Everything is physical. Like, this is genuine brutality. Like, if it's unhinged chaos, like, it doesn't matter. He'll thrive in it. Like, and it was, it was rad. Yeah. No, it was definitely rad. And that was a big spot that I wanted to mention as well, which was that when he does the light tube knees on this spot, instead of, you mentioned it, overdone, the, you know, kick out at one burning spirit spot, if, if you will. Um, Excuse me? <laughs> instead of... <laughs> Instead of doing the light tube knee to the face with the kick out at one to show how just fucking into the match that he was, he does it and Nick Gage doesn't even sell it enough to get to the one count, which is, I think, something that's overlooked. It's like instead of fucking bastardizing the one count kick out spot, he just, he fires up straight off of it, the knee to the face. It blew up, man. Yeah. It was that, like, it was, oh my God. It was like legitimate fever pitch. Like it couldn't get like any gnarlier. Like it, oh man. Yeah, so instead of doing instead of burning the same trope and doing a one star kick out or a one count kick out, he does the same he gets the same reaction but he does it without the kick out, which is like perfect. This match probably would have been the match of the night if it wasn't for just I'll just say like Marcus Crane ruined this fucking match and it, like he hurt it in a lot of ways, but the way that the Osama Kodaka and um Takeda work together here really really gave me like a really nice storyline basis for them being the kind of the colluding Japanese heels and then Nick Gage trying to be the overcoming babyface. But then in the end when when Takeda wins, I didn't feel any letdown. I think that everyone still felt like Takeda earned it. Because there's there's honor amongst thieves. And even with, you know, that they used kind of the numbers advantage to eliminate Marcus Crane, it felt like when it came down to to Gage and Kodaka, it was a man versus man match, and it was very mono a mono. And the way that they did their deathmatch wrestling with the violence and the light tubes, and then you know the stuff that they do with breaking the light tubes over their own head and back bumping into light tubes and all that stuff, does continue to like kind of play off of that storyline and really deliver something. And then you know sending the fans home happy with the big kind of like storyline send off with them giving the promos and. Kodaka earned this. I mean, this is not Kodaka's first time in GCW. He's only, you know, he went over once before. He's had like maybe five, four or five matches in GCW, but I think every one of them has been fantastic. The guy... Just, Takeda. Takeda, yeah. I was saying Kodaka, wasn't I? 
Yes. Takeda has had like four matches in GCW. All of them have been fucking amazing. And the guy felt like he earned this in a lot of ways. Not just in the way that if you pay attention and you know that he's like the undisputed champion of the deathmatch in Japan, but also the fact that you know that like just if you just know what he's done in GCW, he deserves this spot. So, yeah. does anyone else want to talk about the main event here, the the final four, right before we get into like overall thoughts of the show? No, I I haven't talked that much about it, but I think that you guys have basically said everything about it. Okay. It was a it was a good match. The only thing is, I I wanted a little bit more from the Gage Takeda moment. Like it felt like it could have been a little bit bigger uh, on tape, but still, it it ended up working out, and it was still really great. Yeah, and that's a very fair statement to make when it comes to that final because it should have it should have felt bigger and that goes into why the the final was not the best match of the night is that they yeah. didn't get as much as they could out of it. So then we get into like bigger picture booking talking points, which is important to me because I thought that this was I'm not going to say disappointing because it had a lot of really good stuff here, but I felt like they did a much better job, and this is why I say having two deathmatch tournaments in the same company in the same year is tough. Is they did a much better job focusing on and 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 highlighting the foreign talent on the tournament of survival, and they did the same thing. I mean, they had the foreign talent goes over in the end with Cyclope winning the tournament of survival, and when I came out of that, and I still believe this, that I feel like Cyclope is my favorite, like deathmatch guy but what they did was with a good setup here is that Takeda winning this and then Cyclope winning Terminus Survival is I want to see those guys in a deathmatch against each other because I felt Me like too. coming out of Terminus Survival Cyclope felt like the biggest star on the planet Takeda did not feel as much as the biggest star when it comes to deathmatch coming out of that based solely on the Nick Gage Invitational Tournament but knowing his background in Japan helped make him, but I felt like the the tournament survival did a better job when it came to booking the tournament overall. Actually having a semifinal actually having a semifinal round I thought was good. Cause for me for tournaments I really do like having an actual progression instead of just having a first round and then a final. But that's not necessarily like my uh, favorite style. Like for me tournaments I think it's very important for tournaments to stick to the same story or the same match style at least format wise um so like going from a you know singles matches to just a four-way doesn't work for me as well um so like those comparisons hurt and then we talk about it marcus crane why the fuck is he here this guy doesn't feel like he understands the importance of what's going on there's a lot of comparisons between the two tournaments that hurt this show overall more but this show also had much better non-tournament matches so those two big non-tournament matches to me really helped this ma- this show if you compare the two. Um, but yeah, like the booking overall and all those issues like kind of hurt this show for me. Um, I don't know. Does anyone else have any like big picture well, booking issues yeah, or so things they want to talk about? I, I thought that last year's mm-hmm. Nick Age Invitational was better than this one. Um, overall, like I mentioned, the first round of that one was incredible. The and then the final was good as well. Um, Tournament of Survival this year was probably better as, as well. The uh, another first round, although I think of the matches in both of this year's tournaments, I think that the Cologne Takeda match was the best match of any of them. Like I said, it's I think it's the best uh, North American death match this year. Um, I do think one thing that the Nick Age Invitational has going for it oh, over the um, the uh, mm-hmm. tournament of survival is that uh, GCW has a tendency to overextend itself a bit in uh, these tournament main events where sometimes they are a little overly ambitious. And I thought that that happened a bit in the um, final this year with Ciclope versus Miedo Extremo where um, – they did a, like they kind of took apart the ring, and it was just kind of um, chaotic and hard to figure to to really understand what was going on. And maybe the idea of it was better than the execution. Where this uh, tournament final, uh, other than you know Mark Crane, I don't think that it it tried to be something more than it needed to be. Uh, they didn't do any 
crazy gimmicks like last year they did the concrete ring um the the Tremont Gage match in last year's tournament of survival which had just an insane amount of light tubes and everything and and then the tournament of survival this year like I said with the ring and stuff they didn't try to do any of that stuff this year um which I think is credit a credit to this year's final because um it 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 didn't need to be that. And I do also think that as far as the booking goes, that uh, pretty much the booking on the whole show really worked overall as far as uh, who who went one where and, and you know, who was positioned where and, and what the main event ended up being. I do think that the booking worked out pretty well there. So um, I don't think it was a disappointing show. I thought that it was a... It, pretty easy watch and that uh there was some really good stuff and it was it was interesting although I, it wasn't quite at the levels of some of the other similar shows yeah and i think that's the the biggest takeaway for me is that i wouldn't call it disappointing but i think that comparatively to other not just gcw well yeah like comparatively to other gcw um deathmatch tournaments this was not on the top end it was not like one of the better ones I, and and to me, it was very glaring because I felt like Tournament of Survival this year is like on my probably on my show of the year list because just like overall, I thought that everything was fantastic. And part of that was my investment in Cyclope and having Cyclope win the tournament paid off in a way that I was really into. Takeda, I understand like I'm I'm very into Takeda as a wrestler as a deathmatch wrestler from Japan, but I felt like it didn't have the same payoff in the same context and it felt like Cyclope felt like he was the underdog coming in in a lot of ways but he earned my respect throughout the tournament and then when he won it in the end I felt like super behind him and I felt like I came through something Takeda to me felt like the presumptive winner as the presumptive best deathmatch wrestler on the planet so having him end up winning it didn't feel as much of a big investment but that's coming from me um Tomas, what did you feel overall, like big picture, looking at this? I, I don't know if you've watched all the other deathmatch tournaments um, from GCW in the past before, um, but like, how did you feel coming out of this show? Yeah, I mean, comparatively to you guys, I don't know about Drew, but um, I definitely don't watch nearly as much American deathmatch. I usually kind of use Kevin as like this beacon of pro wrestling, where I kind of say I have four or five different companies that I follow. And he kind of just watches everything, and if this sounds good, then I'll take a dip here and there. But um, obviously, I was extremely invested in Takeda and Asami as two of my favorite wrestlers just in general. Um, Nick Gage is rad. A lot of these guys that I know or have seen from other places, it was just kind of like one of those things that when it was announced, I was like, I have to do this. Like, I'm not sure if and when I'll ever get to Japan to see Takeda, like, you know, in, in person like that so it was like one of those opportunities i had to jump on and um like i said top to bottom it just was it was fun it was extremely exhausting like i had just gone to progress before like maybe a couple weeks before when they were here in detroit and i left the show and i was like hmm yeah it was a good show that was fun you know what i mean like i still had like a pep in my step but like by the end of the nick gage invitation like i was exhausted like it was so exhilarating and I know I said it before at the beginning, but it was like modern day gladiators. Like there was so much blood and I had never been around such violence. Like it's, it's just something. And I was even telling some of my friends, they're like, Oh, Hey, you know, how was the thing you went to? And I was like, look, like if it's anywhere near us next year, you guys should come. Even if you're not a wrestling fan, like it's, you know, everyone watches world star for people getting beaten up. And like, there's a, a disgusting primitive caveman, like in all of us that, wants to see some sort of violence and it's like it did that well on top of being a good professional wrestling show on top of it all and all together it was like a very neat package and i enjoyed it it wasn't too long i wasn't like i didn't think any of the matches were like oh god like you know looking at my watch but all in all it was great so most importantly i want to say thank you kevin bow <laughs> you know for putting me onto this kind of stuff because it was definitely like a one of the coolest experiences in my life for sure all right, well, coming out of it, Drew, what was your feelings overall? Did you watch Terminal Survival this year? What, how do you think they compare? I did, and I liked Tournament of Survival. I am having trouble remembering it right now. I liked this show. Uh, 
that's kind of all I have to say about it. I, I was it was really enjoyable to watch. the The thing that stuck out to me every time I see Nick Gage, uh, just the the guy's aura and his presence is is bigger somehow, and it just it it's always really striking. And then you know add Takeda in that, and add Alex Cologne in there, that and. Uh, Kodaka as well. I don't know. Very cool. Very cool stuff to see. And then G Raver as well. Yeah. You know, I yeah. like him. And not not to not to be outdone. Well, G G Raver added a lot to the show. I think so. Yeah. I I thought it was really cool. I I really enjoyed watching it. Well, imagine. And I'm not. Uh, oh, world... yeah. I was just gonna say. Um, you know, American death matches are a little bit. You know, I'm not as into it, and it's a little bit harder for me to get into. Uh, I think it's a little bit more inconsistent than a lot of the Japanese stuff. But, um, yeah, this was good. I enjoyed yeah. it a lot. And imagine if Jimmy Lloyd had been in the final. I don't I don't know what, yeah. like, how different that would have been, you know? Yeah, yeah. So that's, like, yeah. a thing to think about. And then comparing – we can break this down another time when we get into this. When uh, when I'm a guest again on your podcast, Drew. Um, there you go. Podcast, <laughs> um, whenever you guys figure that out. It's, uh, it's going to be Kevin and Tomas. <laughs> for me. I was there. guys I was talking to Sammy the other day I had lunch with Sammy you know Kevin yeah and Tomas yeah he's um, so rad yeah Just he Sammy. Is. yeah and I was I was saying you three should uh, do a podcast together maybe we'll see it's a good, I've thought about it I thought I'm about sh- it I'm shaking my head right now <laughs> <laughs> but yeah the um yeah the, the the overall feeling coming out of this was like pretty pretty good for me like i said it was just i just didn't have that same feeling that i had on the um term of survival but that doesn't make this a bad show it's just like i feel like i really like hyped to the term of survival super hard because i really Mm -hmm. enjoyed it a lot um and the way that it came out of it i thought it really presented uh, it made a star and this show didn't feel like it made a star but i feel like it presented a star and then kevin was i think on page with me which is like a Takeda versus sequel play match is now like feels like a big deal. Yeah, which, I wanted it going into this, and so I'm still waiting for it. Yeah, and it doesn't feel like the other years where they had both the Terminal Survival and the Nick Gage Invitational that it felt like coming out of it they presented the two winners as two guys that you really want to see fight each other. But they did a good job here with them both being international stars. But I would be remiss if we didn't finish this show out without giving people a chance to plug um, whatever things they want people to pay attention to. So, let's start with Tomas as the newest guest. Tomas, what do people need to check out? What do people need to check out? Oh, man. Whatever floats your boat, I'm going to go. I know, we, I know we just talked about Deathmatch this whole time, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. If you like comedy wrestling, if you like strong style if you like british guys rolling around that's fucking sick man watch whatever you want who gives a fuck what the internet has to say if you enjoy it that's rad but you everyone should watch ddt i know drew feels me on that first ever female heavyweight or you know open weight champion that's dope but seriously um now i don't know it was it's wrestling is in i tell kevin this very much like i tell him so often we're in like a golden age of wrestling with, with streaming, with the level of talent, everything. It's so rad. Um, thank you for letting me do this. Like Kevin, Drew, you know, I love you guys. Uh, yeah, I don't know, man. Wrestling's <laughs> sick. That's well, about it. Should they follow you on Twitter? Should they follow you on Instagram? Oh, uh, no. Nobody needs to see all those big anime titties I put on the timeline. That's <laughs> that's that's not that's not me. You can follow, you can follow me at underscore burning spirits. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kevin. Um, I'm on. I'm on got? Twitter. Stan underscore underscore Hanson. There we go. All right, Drew. Uh, hey, <laughs> I want to ask real fast. It did, it didn't come off like I was like a Nazi sympathizer or anything, did it? Oh, it uh, definitely no. did for sure. Yeah. Oh no, Tomas, are you I, being serious? I, I was gonna. I was gonna slide in your. I was gonna slide in your. Fuck no, dude. What do you mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, because I was honestly. I know this is the end. I was honestly gonna say the same thing because I I've grown up in Metro Detroit, right? Like, so I've mm-hmm. been around like a lot of black, white, and as a Mexican, not to get too. I've dealt with it. You know what I mean? And like, yeah. as as far as wrestling goes, I think 
not to dive too deep, but I think people need to understand like the whole business is fucked, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like because somebody said something on our very secret message board that like somebody's like, oh yeah, Nazis at a rest, and it's like, all right, is a Nazi any shittier than like what Vince or like you know all these crazy stories that you hear? So it's like, I'm not saying I fuck with that in any by by any means. I've had my own run-ins with it. It's not fucking cool. The fact that Nazis are more open now is fucking insane. But it's like I don't want to think about that when I'm watching wrestling unless it's like Nick Gage is like, yo, fuck that black guy. Then it's like, okay, that's fucked up. Until then, he's the fucking king. No, you didn't seem like a Nazi sympathizer, Drew. I love you guys. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Tomas Tomas said it uh, better than I did. And I I do want to say I hope hope it didn't sound like I was – I was uh, shortchanging Quentin Moody's, you know, opinions on that or anything. Because nah. I, I, I really like Quentin. He, yeah, I like him a lot. Us. So, oh, <laughs> come on now. <laughs> uh, no, sorry. really. You know, you know what? I'll, you know what I'll plug is Quentin Moody. Yes. One of the, one of the most I thoughtful guys, I think. Sexy as fuck. Oh, <laughs> oh I dear. Him so hard. Um, this guy's got I, it all. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, I'd, I'd say one of the most thoughtful. Uh, wrestling uh voices uh or you know people on the internet for sure um good and that's good why, podcaster that's why this motherfucker at his young tender young age still says shit that like um becomes like very very um new and fresh and interesting to me and shit that i would never have thought of because it comes from a different background not just that but also comes from like a a thought perspective that i don't necessarily always hit Um, yeah but but anyways back to me yes (laughs) back to drew drew follow um i guess it's just me more or less now uh on twitter if you like at underscore burning spirits uh the show burning spirits is uh on a permanent hiatus hopefully tomas and kevin will come back and do it but uh (laughs) Uh, yeah, you never know. I, hopefully, we'll kind of pop up on stuff here and there, and who knows where. But yep, yeah, that's we all. Still do private episodes just between us. There you go. <laughs> yeah. But I, what a delight that I got to talk to Tomas again, and talk to Kevin, and not again for the first time. I got to talk to Tomas and talk to Kevin again, first time in a long time, and talk to Timothy again. I haven't talked to you in a long time, so this was a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. A lot of fun. Yeah, thank you. And so, Drew, we have to make this plan, so let's figure this out. So, uh, Does your wife like thrift shopping or like records or anything like that? I feel like you're more of a uh, person than me. Yeah, she doesn't like records. She does like thrift store shopping. Okay, so we can make this yeah. work. I mean, you can go for yeah. a, a jog on a Sunday morning or a hike oh. on a Sunday morning, and they can go oh, yeah. do some brunch. And we can meet them up and do the whole yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would love it. This sounds like a lot of fun, so we'll get into this. This is, just so everyone knows, this is what Southern California life is like. You know, we go to brunch, we do record shopping, we do some thrift shopping, we do hikes. That's what it's all about until the tsunamis start to hit us. Um, yeah, and then the fires come and burn all the houses down, and <laughs> yes. then the floods come and mud kills us all, and then the earth boils <laughs> us to death. Guy. And then you finally break off the United States. Yeah. yeah. So, um, rather than... And then I, I finally go to bed. Yeah, please. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, um, I'm hungry. I haven't eaten dinner yet. We should yet. all eat. We should all fuck. We should all do everything. So this is what I'm going to say. I don't care about sounding like a Nazi sympathizer. I think rape <laughs> is good. Um, <laughs> no, thank you all for listening. This has gone very oh. long. Um, Deathmatch is not necessarily for everyone, but it might be for you. Um, Only death is real. <laughs> Oh, we let you wish you for